Let's get ready to RPG! 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 Hello, good evening. Happy Thursday to everyone out there in YouTube land. My name is Derek Melinda. Welcome to the Night's Last Call. We are back. It feels like uh, we've been gone for a while, but we were just here Tuesday. Uh, let's see how everybody's thing here going. All right, great. Everything looks good on my end. Hopefully everything looks and sounds good on your end as well. So tonight, Powered by the Apocalypse, Forged in the Dark. Um, we have talked about these games a lot. And I continue to see conversation, including in the Night's of Last Call Discord, which of course is part of our Patreon, uh, with people having questions and not quite fully understanding, uh, not in like in a, in a bad way, but like being very openly, like I don't quite understand this or I don't fully grasp what they're trying to say here or I don't understand how to do this thing. So because I like to help my patrons out as much as I can, I said, okay, you know what? You guys have been talking about it. Let's do a stream on it and put your questions, you know, into the uh, into the Discord, and we'll try to answer them. So my patrons have done that, and I have a long list of questions that we can go through. Maybe some of these will apply to you. Uh, if you want to ask a question in the chat, we do have a nice little list. So if you do want to ask a question in the chat, I ask that you throw it into a super chat or a tip, and I will make sure that I I, I go ahead and get to that as well. But Probably won't have time to get to just random questions in chat. Sorry. That being said, we do have two goals tonight. If we reach our super chat goal of $75, I'll extend the stream. If we're getting that many super chats, it probably means that we're getting some good questions asked. You know us. We like to go on to tangents. So I'll make sure that we we spend an extra uh, hour, hour and a half, or whatever it takes uh, to try to get through those questions. And then our other tip goal will be, I've, I've heard a lot of people kind of talking about uh, campaign creation. And so if we can reach that tip goal, maybe we can you know, take 45 minutes, 30 minutes, and we can sort of do a example of how maybe I would set up a Forged in the Dark campaign. So does that sound good? Does that, does that sound like a reasonable approach? Let's say hi to everybody. Uh, Karama is here and he rolled a nine on his make something up check. Am I playing PBTA right yet? You're almost there. Um, you're, you're very close. Um, K Stein, K A Stein Wine says, "Come for Pathfinder Second Edition. Stay for the Power by the Apocalypse. Excellent. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we're we're trying to cover all the things. I will say this: even if you are a dead, steadfast, die-hard Pathfinder Second Edition player or D and D Fifth Edition player, I do think that there are concepts or ideas or strategies that are inherent in the Powered by the Apocalypse." sort of mantra in terms of its principles, its agendas that I think can actually have a very strong effect, positive effect on your game. Uh, especially, especially if, uh, and we'll kind of talk more about this, but especially if you view yourself as more of a collaborative storyteller rather than a, uh, a force to be challenged and overcome. Um, Calamacus, a new a member of the Night's nice Last Call Patreon, uh, just joined this week. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. All right, well, uh, I don't know if we have napalm here, but uh, and I do like that movie, if that's what we're quoting. I picked the wrong day to stop sniffing glue. I think that one's from Airplane. Uh, Golda Cat is here to religiously froth over Perilous Wilds and nothing else. Roll for Combat says that he's going to steal my song and put it on his show. It is, it is public domain. No, uh, no, it's not actually. It's through, you do have to have a license for it, but you can buy the license. So knock yourself out. <laughs> Just steal everything that I have. It's fine. Uh, evening to you, Todd. K Steinwand again, talking about the glue. We should be inhaling fanners. Point blank. Hello, hello. Welcome, welcome. Pepper, hello. Beowulf, good morning to you as well. GM Scott, one of the reasons we are having this stream today is because uh, GM Scott is in the process of getting some uh, Forge in the Dark games set up and had some questions and we was kind of going back and forth with some of the folks on the Discord and I thought, hey, let me help out my buddy Scott. Uh, Jekyll says, what's up? What's up, Jekyll? 
Haven't really played any PBTA yet, but I really want to run Candela Obscura or Band of Blades. So this stream is perfect. Yeah, band, anything we talk about with Forge and Dark will carry over into bands, Band of Blades. So we're good there. Um, <laughs> let's see here. I hope position and effect gets a deep dive. Now we have talked about position and effect before, but we'll, we'll see what the questions are and we'll try to get into it. Um, Cephalopod is here. Hello. Hello. Gurney is here. And Ken says, hi everyone. I hope this stream will help us all with a Candela Obscura first look at the future. Yeah, Ken. So a couple of things real quick, by the way, speaking of tip goals last week, we had two tip goals that got reached. One was just, Hey Derek, thanks for being awesome. And we love you. And thanks for doing this. Um, Scotty P in the house. Scott P tipped $25. Let's go campaign set up. All right. Well, Scott P getting us off to a strong spot. Thank you, Scott, for that. And, uh, yeah, I hope we. I uh, that'd be a fun goal to reach, and it'd be a fun thing to talk about. So, Scott, thank you so much for your support, and thank you for uh, throwing in such a, a a big chunk there into that tip goal. Um, thanks a lot, Scott. All right, John, coming in. John H. Tip ten dollars. In retrospect, we should just get rid of things like degrees of success, position, effect, etc. Just too much effort. Let's just make everything pass slash fail, except for when we don't. If we didn't, maybe, sometimes, or not. Uh, well, uh, John, John uh, you know, honestly, uh, it, it could be John Harper is in the chat. I'm not sure if it's John Harper or not, but, um, you know, I, I, John's basically saying, you know what, maybe it's better if we just get rid of all of the nuances of mechanics and just make everything pass fail. And, uh, you know, we'll go with that. Uh, thank you, John, for that, uh, support. Um, appreciate, <laughs> appreciate your, uh, unique take. You know, I, maybe some will create a game like that where it almost looks like they're going to create degrees of success and then they choose not to, and just go, you know, randomly all over the place. Um, let's see here. But anyways, uh, to Ken's point, uh, thank you, Scott. Thank you, John, for those supports. Um, we had two tip goals last week. One was to do a Candela Obscura. One was to do an MCDM, uh, sort of deeper dive. Um, now I don't want to do reviews of a game unless I played it. Uh, I don't know if, and when I can get a Candela Obscura game ran, but I did, I am going to actually dig into the game and do a more proper impression video of it, uh, because of that tip goal. And I really want to give the game a fair shake because I know that it's had a lot of criticism and I can't help, but wonder if the criticism is just because people don't understand Forge in the Dark games. I could be wrong, but we'll see about that. As for MCDM, me, Bob, Smith, some of our other uh, uh, local pals are getting together tomorrow and we're going to run the MCDM play test. So we should have some, you know, action. That, that'll be a real review of the game as it is in development because we'll have actually some uh, firsthand experience playing the game. Uh, Isaiah is tuning in for a bit till after uh, to chill after bedtime. Awesome. Uh, Gurney just finished Dragon Bane one shot. Awesome. Awesome. We're actually setting up uh, Bob is going to be running 10 games of Dragon Bane for our patrons here over the next couple of uh, weeks, months. And uh, I think every other week there's going to be a Dragon Bane game. So I had fun. We played it the other day during the holiday break, and I thought it was a fun little game. Kind of rule, you know, not too, I wouldn't say it's rules light, but it's rules medium, rules medium light. John H. Tip $10. Yo, I'm going to let you finish, but if my boy Ben is in the chat, just wanted to let you know that the 7th C5E conversion is almost ready to go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, you know, he's going to let me finish. Uh, but 7th C, coming to 5E. Wow. What a what a remarkable, incredible uh, thing. You know, I think that's, I think 7th C will find, you know, it worked for Legend of the Five Rings, right? It worked for Adventures in Rokugan. They came in there and that, that, that skyrocketed interest into into Rokugan to a way that I had never seen before. Um, oh, Beowulf, thank you so much. If you're, you're a patron, of course, that's the best thing that you could ever do. Oh no, the game designers are fighting each other. Who needs position and effect when you could have three actions and four levels of success instead. That's so, yeah, wow. Is it position and effect when you could have three action economy and four levels of success. Wow. Now there, you know what, you know, they, they do celebrity boxing. You know, I know these game designers are always like hard up for cash because nobody gets paid well enough, except for apparently the MCDM designers. Let's do celebrity game designer 
like boxing. Um, <laughs> well, it's a form of success. You know, it's a, the success was you failed. See, and, and the nice thing about it is if you fail, at least you didn't critically fail. So you could feel good about the fact that you only failed. You didn't critically fail. Um, let's see here. Sidon's going to stay until he knocks himself out. Sick. Awesome. Great. Uh, William Brandis uh, blowing up. He can't believe it. John Harper is in the chat. That's incredible. Wow. Um, this system sounds amazing, Compy. We should definitely we should definitely do go ahead and do that as as point blank suggested. Um, I'd be down for that. It's going to be in claymation form. No, I'm thinking like the real thing. Um, okay. Well, thank you for that uh, bevy and explosion of tips, everybody. Thank you so much uh, to uh, to John and Jason and Scotty P. We're gonna go ahead and and uh, all right. Well, the other Scott is in the house. <laughs> Uh, GM Scott tip $25. I better get in here. Too. Or, all right. Well, GM Scott finishing us off. Thank you, GM Scott. Uh, I, I appreciate that you want to, you better get in here too. All right. So there you go. Tip gold created. So we will do a forged in the dark sort of uh, mini campaign creation process so that I can sort of, we can maybe do it collaboratively as a group, or we can kind of walk through the system as such. Uh, so awesome. And, uh, of course, we do have a super chat goal as well, just to kind of, if we want to extend the stream a little bit, uh, you know, put some put some money in my pocket and and we'll uh, we'll keep it going. We'll keep it hot. All right. So, like I said, I have some questions. I have a lot of questions that the members of my Patreon have asked. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get in there. <laughs> John Harper not giving up the fight. John H. tipped five dollars. Jason, get so, your ass out of here. This channel is for game design conversations, something you don't know anything about. I've seen the product you like to distribute to your coworkers. Good on you for making something real life halflings could play with. <laughs> John H. Unknown if it's John Harper or not. Wow. Throwing throwing out mad shade. Wow. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there, pff, John, John H. Unknown if it's John Harper saying... Get out of here. <laughs> Jason B tipped five dollars. I've watched game design videos. Wow, there is a, there's like a there's a, a war going on between these folks in chat, and uh, we're the beneficiaries because we're getting all these tips. Um, <laughs> Jason, <laughs> the, now Chad is more interested in, in these guys going back and forth. Shots fired. Um, Diet Dew. Oh, yes. We actually have two things today here, K Steinwine. We have Diet Mountain Dew and, of course, a nice big one liter bottle of smart water. Um, interestingly, uh, wait, just why? I actually, well, number one, I don't drink regular soda. I only drink diet soda. And number two, uh, thick, like, uh, colored colas, like Diet Pepsi, Diet Coke. I'll drink them. I think they're good, but they've, they've gotten so thick to me lately that I, I prefer, this, this feels much more crisp and refreshing. Um, maybe it has, feels like it has more caffeine. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, well, don't worry about that, Isaiah. We already hit a tip goal. We're going to go. We're, we're, we're going a long time. All right. So let's first, for starters, let's start off by heading over to yours and mine, our favorite. Excuse me. The whiteboard. All right. Um, so we, like I said, we have a couple of questions. I'm going to start with, um, I'm going to start with some questions that we had from our, uh, members of our, uh, Patreon. So London and London asked a couple of questions, but I'll do one and maybe we'll come back and we'll, you know, kind of go back for this who asked for, so what are some tips and tricks for combat with out initiative all right so this is the first question and i and honestly you know what i have seen this um i have seen this question asked a lot and so i think it's definitely something that we could we could definitely you know we could definitely cover and again remember uh, i apologize if I, I miss chat a little bit um because on these streams when i'm working with the uh, whiteboard and stuff. I'm not as focused on the chat. Um, 
Uh, think Forge and the Dark Advice could carry over to Wild Sea. I know they're not quite the same, but I'm gearing up to play Wild Sea. I, th I do think, actually. I think they could carry over very, very nicely. Um, okay, so this is a converse. This is a question that I, I, I get a lot, and I've seen a lot of problems with it. For starters, I will say Wild Sea has some actually excellent advice about this, which applies to Powered by the Apocalypse or Forge and Dark. So this advice here is sort of, a, this advice is both Powered by the Apocalypse and Forge in the Dark, which is the beauty of not having an initiative system is that you can keep kind of everybody engaged at once. And it may not seem like that is the case, but let me hear me out. For starters, uh, the, the first thing to realize is you do not, not, not every character needs to have the exact same number of actions, okay? Or uh, what Wild Sea would call reactions to feel like they contributed equally. All right, so, um, you know, let's say that we have, I'm just gonna pick some people from chat here. All right, so let's say that we had, well, we had London who asked the question, and then we have uh, we have Isaiah, okay? And then we have Neutromancer, okay? So let's say that these are the players at my table. So the first thing to understand is without initiative, you have the ability to take the spotlight and move it to wherever it makes the most sense in the fiction. So for starters, it may be that this is an important scene or this is an important combat or this is an important uh, moment for a character like London. Uh, imagine that you know, you're, you're having a, you know, a dungeon based game, maybe you're playing dungeon world and suddenly in a crypt, the, you know, the sarcophagi lids get flipped off and shambling whites begin crawling forth. You might look to the cleric and, you know, this, this might be a good time for the cleric to shine. So it, it is an ability for you to sort of stay focused on the cleric. But the other thing that you can do is this is what wild sea recommends. Now I kind of do this in my head, but as you're going through, you can sort of mark, you know, what, what Wild Sea calls an action for an A or a reaction, R, every time a character takes one of those actions. So an action is when a character is taking some sort of proactive action. They're the ones taking, a, you know, a definitive position. They're trying to engage with the fiction. Second thing is a reaction. That's where I do something to them and they are forced to respond. So, for example, you know, uh, London may charge forward heroically with his uh, flaming holy symbol high above him, and that is an action. And then maybe Isaiah takes an action, and then maybe London takes an action. And then I attack Neutromancer, and I ask him to, like, you know, uh, one of the whites breaks free from the turn undead ability and shambles over to you. What do you do? Right. And I'm kind of putting the pressure on him, you know, to 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 react. But it's not like he got to make his mind up and decision up. So you can kind of kind of go back and forth and you can actually track this on just a, a sheet of note card. This is what Wild Sea recommends. And I think this is like a really, really great idea. I don't think you have to be this prescriptive. It doesn't have to end up that everybody has had, you know, exactly the same number of actions and reactions at the end of a fight. But I do think it is a, a useful tool if you're getting new to the game. But. There's a little bit more to this than just initiative, and this is why this, 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 this stream could take a long time. And this is more about me expressing how I take advantage of the fact that there's no initiative order, which is, and why I can make everybody feel like they're kind of participating at once. Because what I can do is I can say, I can say, London, what are you doing? And London goes, okay, I am, uh, you know, I'm charging forward with my holy symbol and I'm going to smite them with my undead holy radiance. And I go, okay, London, you begin, you know, moving forward into the crypt. The whites howl and hiss and two begin falling back along the wayside. Isaiah, while London is moving forward about to turn undead, what are you, what are you doing, you know, real quickly? And even though it is like, London feels like his turn is in progress and he can imagine his character striding forward, the flames beginning to lick off of his holy symbol and illuminate the dark chamber. But then very quickly, I can just hop over to Isaiah and I can ask for an action from him, something small, something quick, all right? He might take an action and then we go back to London and then we complete that action. And then we can hop over to Neutromancer and you could phrase it different ways. You could say, all right, Neutromancer, all this is happening, all of this is going on. What are you doing? What do you wanna do? 
how do you do that? Or you could simply make a soft move and then give the ball to them. You know, you could say that, uh, you know, amidst the, the fight and the ferocious, ferocious melee, you suddenly see a dark shape, shadowy, forming out of the nothingness. This is a GM soft move, right? This is a uh, foretelling future badness. I'm telling them that some sort of powerful incorporeal undead is beginning to form and coalesce in the chamber. But I am going to pass the baton quickly over to Nutromancer to find out what he wants to do. And he might take a proactive action. And then I'll say, okay, great. While you're doing that, quickly, let back to Isaiah. And you can just kind of keep everybody engaged. You also have the opportunity when, if you, again, some of this takes a certain amount of responsibility and maturity from your players. There are moves in a lot of these Powered by the Apocalypse games like help or aid or defend, especially in a game like Dungeon World, where another character can kind of uh, step in and take a hit for you. So one thing that I like to do, again, it's, it, you know, I will, I will say this, um, you know, PBTA games and, and Forge in the Dark games, you know, we, we were talking, I don't know if it was this week. Maybe it was last week. We were talking about creative versus tactical agendas in role-playing games. And I, I think, and I, I'm just going to put here, just I'm going to put trad RPG. Okay. Um, in a traditional RPG, D&D, Pathfinder, right? Uh, your, your players, uh, or I should say, how can I put this? The... Players have fun by being challenged. There is, there is an inherent component to the way that D20 is set up. That it is, it is a challenge-based game, right? It is a challenge-based um, system. There's kind of a, I don't know, I, I, it, it's kind of like a game. I mean, I'm not saying that you're trying to win, but you're kind of trying to win, right? Like you're trying to beat the bad guys and you're trying to overcome the challenges. And that's why things like balance and stuff are so important. That's a traditional RPG. In a Powered by the Apocalypse or Forged in the Dark game, the challenge, okay, is having fun. So another way to think of it is, Traditional RPGs are all about the challenge, in my personal opinion. And Powered by the Apocalypse and Forge in the Dark Games are all about entertainment. I am not trying, when I play a Forged in the Dark game, to challenge my opponent, you know, to, to challenge my, my P players. I'm not trying to get them to have to, like, overcome, you know, these incredible odds and, and, and play well and play smart and try to like see if they have the sick character build or the, the mental wits to combat as war their way to a victory, right? My role, my goal as a game master, very much more in a Powered by the Apocalypse game, is one where I am just trying to create cool, fun, entertaining moments. And the game is set up to really allow me to do that. So part of what I'm trying to do when I, when I run a game is I am looking for moments where I can show off how cool a character is and look for moments where I can highlight how awesome they are. So as an example to that, um, you know, as a nice, ex oh, hey, we had a super chat from Lope. How long have you played the RPG and how many RPGs? Uh, Lope, I, I assume, do you mean, do you mean Blades in the Dark or Powered by the Apocalypse? Um, I mean, I, I started playing Apocalypse World and, uh, and Dungeon World back when they came out, uh, maybe like a year or two later. So I've, I mean, probably been playing these games for about 10 or 15 years. I've been playing RPGs uh, for close to 31 years, 32 years. So a very, very long time. How many RPGs have I played? I don't know. Hundreds? I, a lot. <laughs> I own hundreds. I, I haven't played everything on my shelf, but uh, I, that's uh, that is definitely the case. Um, Panic, good afternoon to you as well. Uh, so anyways... So, for example, what I was talking about showing characters of awesome badassness. And, and I get it, like this is this may sound very counterintuitive to a challenge based GM. OK, where you're used to like thinking about like, how do I challenge my PCs? OK, and let's imagine a sequence of events. OK, um, 
you know, I, I'll just use traditional D20 narrative here just to keep it easy. Okay. So the rogue makes, uh, you know, makes, you know, talks about how he, he sneaks up behind the, uh, you know, the goblin priest and stabs him in the back. Okay. But let's say that the rogue rolls a six minus. Okay. Um, so now as a GM, I can make as hard of a move as I like. And I describe that, uh, you know, the, the goblin war priest, uh, you know, spins away cackling madly as a horrific curse, uh, you know, that descends upon the rogue. And then he takes that dark energy and he shoots it out at the wizard. Okay. Now, this might be a moment where I uh, let the, uh, or you know what, actually we'll do something, we'll do one better. This is the Dark Goblin Priest, right? Dark Goblin War Mage. He shoots it out at the fighter. You know, the crippling the crippling curse of the fire that will not die, right? This powerful thing that eats away the soul. So as a result of the rogue's action, I am attacking the fighter. But that's not really my goal. My goal is even after I say that, I don't go to the fighter, okay? I go to the wizard and I say, hey, wizard, the, the, the dark goblin mage is casting a horrific hex on the fighter. What do you do? And this is an opportunity for the wizard to maybe talk about how they step up and they throw their hands into the air and they speak three powerful words of magic and dispel the, you know, have like a wizard's duel. You end up having some sort of weird wizard's duel. And I might focus in on the wizard going back and forth and back and forth with this, the, this dark goblin war priest, war mage for a couple exchanges, right? Because this is kind of like a moment where, you know, if you're watching a movie, you know that the other Avengers are off fighting their battles, their things are, they're going to get their time, but this is a big moment. And we're going to zoom in on this moment and we're going to stay with this moment for a little bit. Um, and basically the whole chain of this events wasn't to see if I could knock somebody to zero, or it wasn't to try to like take somebody down. I was deliberately creating a moment where not to be fair, you know, it's powered by the apocalypse. Things can go wrong. People can roll bad, but I am trying to create a moment that is going to allow a character, uh, a moment of greatness, right. And a moment of awesomeness. Um, and again, I, I, I talked about this scenario, but I could flip it the other way, right. Where, you know, the rogue tries to kill the, you know, the ogre from the shadows rolls really badly. I describe that the ogre just reaches over his shoulder, you know, kind of does, you know, this is how, this is how I would probably say it in, uh, like in a game, because I like to, you know, I like for people to have common points of reference and resonance. I might be like, okay, so you're like flying through the air to stab the ogre in the back, right? But he totally night kings you like with Arya where he turns and he just grabs you by the throat, except this isn't Game of Thrones. So there's, you know, you could try to drop your knife or anything that just doesn't work because he just throws you across the room. And as you're sailing end over end over end, the ogre re-grabs his club, spies the wizard at the other end of the room and begins charging thunderous footfalls, you know, ricocheting and roaring through the chamber. Fighter, what do you do? You see the ogre charging for the wizard. This is me doing the opposite. This is me giving, this is me throwing the, the, the spotlight to the fighter. The, o the rogue has failed. The wizard is in the crosshairs and they're in trouble. This is not their time to shine. It's the fighter's time to shine. So sometimes for me, the key to managing a combat is realizing who, who, who has a cool moment here and who could take advantage of that spotlight and who, who would this be a fun moment for? Who, who can I show off? And so that is where I definitely sort of lean to when it comes to things like how do I handle, you know, combat without initiative? I, I basically, because I don't have to go in a strict order, I go in the order that's going to be the most fun the most engaging and the most uh, entertaining. Um, yeah. So uh, Nutriman says you win by how cool the fight was. Exactly. I am trying to, I'm trying to create experiences. I am trying to create moments. I'm trying to create awesome, unpredictable. Remember, I don't have. My goal isn't to enact an exact plan. Let me put it this way. I do not have a destination in mind. Think of it like a, a road trip. I don't have a destination in mind. I just want the journey along the way to wherever we're going to be a scenic one. 
Okay. That's all I'm interested in doing is creating cool, amazing moments that kind of expand naturally towards some conclusion, but I don't know what that conclusion is. All I can do is make sure that the, the, the journey along the way is fun and full of fantastic sights and, and great moments. Right. Um, right. In, in a traditional RPG, I, I didn't die today. I leveled up, right? We, we, it, it's, a, it's a very pass fail kind of mentality, right? I died bad. I leveled up good. Uh, Compi says counterspelling is very fun narratively. I think I, I'm crazy here. And I, I know that there's some people in chat. I know, I, I know Smith was in chat for a little bit. I think the coolest thing that a wizard can do is when they counterspell. Um, I, to me, like that is cooler than casting the spell. I think counterspelling is like one of the baddest ass moments of, of, of any game. Um, now, Gold the Cat, I think, is being a little bit uh, uh, facetious here, but he says, but that's not fair, Derek. Why are you punishing the fighter for the rogue player's bad role? <sighs> uh, I mean, I know you're just joking here, but and we're not going to go down this exact line here. But yeah, I mean, this is a mentality that I think people have to understand something. Um, and I, I want to kind of touch on this while we're here. OK, uh, and I'm trying to think of the best way to describe this. OK. <clears throat> In traditional RPGs, the dice roll represents a physical slash real event, okay? And it's based off of the probabilities, right? Probability percentage. So in other words, um, you are climbing this wall, okay? So make a strength check, right? D20 plus strength. And we understand intuitively, oh, my character is stronger. Now, some people might even say like, well, does that really make you better at climbing? Yeah, to a certain extent, but whatever. We'll ignore it for a second. Um, so that is going to allow me to get a higher number. And that means I am more likely to climb this wall, right? And of course, if the wall is harder to climb, if it has smaller footholds, if it's flat sheet rock granite, then we would understand that the DC would be higher. Thus, the probability that we succeed goes down, right? So it's, it's modeling something in the real world. In PPTA, okay, or Forge in the Dark, this is not the case. And it's, and, and, and I blame, I don't know. I blame game designers. <laughs> I blame, I blame Adam Coble and Sage Latora specifically for dungeon world because they decided to use attributes that sound like they are D and D or physical things. And they're not really those things. Okay. Because when someone climbs in a game, let's say if you're climbing in dungeon world, uh, and let's say that it's, it's, you know, difficult enough that it requires a role. You might use a defy danger role and it's going to be 2d6 plus your strength. And this may look very similar to this, but they are not the same because defy danger is not modeling how hard it is to climb the, the, the cliff face, nor is it modeling how good you are at climbing the cliff face because defy danger. There, there's no DC. It's always just, you know, six minus seven to nine, 10 plus. And you have an attribute called strength, but the, instead of thinking of strength in PBTA as being how strong you are, think of it more as how often in the narrative, okay, does your character encounter difficulties or problems because of their strength. And if the answer is infrequently, then your character is, has a high strength. The defy danger in, in powered by the apocalypse, the climb event is not an event. Okay. It is a, it is, it is a story generator. It is not a physics engine. It is attempting to create interesting plot moments in the course of a game, 
right? And we kind of fundamentally understand this, right? If the wizard goes to climb the rock face, if you were watching that scene, I mean, think about this. If you were watching that scene at home and the characters are going up the, the mountainside, it would feel kind of incongruent to you as an audience if the you know the very strong and martially capable athletic character was the one who fell off the cliff. If anybody's going to have a problem with the cliff, right, it's going to be the old wizard who refuses help. And the game reflects that by showing us that his strength score is low in, in a game like Dungeon World, and thus he is more likely to create a sort of what we would call a, 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 you know, thirsty sword lesbians would call it a mixed beat, right? Or a downbeat in the story, right? Where, uh-oh, you know, you, you imagine that scene, right? Where we'll help you out. I don't need your help. I'm, I've been doing this for 150 years. Do not think that I, do, I need your help. I was climbing mountains when you were, uh, when your grandfather was just a baby, right? And then, the wizard starts going up and then, you know, the, the, the camera pans to the wizard and you can see him kind of struggling. And then he looks up and like the rock is starting to crack and you go, Oh no. And you go, of course, of course this is happening to this character because the game's mechanics and probability factors are designed such that it is unlikely that the wizard is just going to skate up with no problems. They are more likely to create issues and problems. And so the physics engine of, of, powered by the apocalypse doesn't exist everything that you do think of it as you're you're rolling on a random story generator so all right um do, do, do. let's see here uh is be a fan of the pcs yes exactly that that is what we're trying to do um all right uh let us go and again, uh, you know, I apologize if we have things here, but uh, London asked a couple other questions. So um, I'm, I'm going to get to, I'll get to them later, but um, he did want to know a question, which is, is there a sweet spot? Um, here we go. Is there a sweet spot for pure number of active clocks? And if so, what is it? Uh, great question. Um, so, you know, we're talking about like a Forge in the Dark game and you're, managing a bunch of stuff. My general rule of thumb is that anywhere from, now this is for your clocks, okay? Because in Forge in the Dark, a good Forge in the Dark game, uh, the PCs should have their own clocks, right? They should have their own long-term projects, or maybe they have healing clocks, or they have crew clocks. These are their clocks, all right? Um, but in terms of, you know, GM slash world managed clocks world. There we go. Um, I like there to be probably somewhere between the number of PCs to number of PCs times two. Uh, and this is of course, assuming that you have somewhere between uh, three to five PCs. Um, if you have three PCs, I think going, you know, all right, fine. If you have three PCs, I think going between three to seven is good. If you have four PCs, I like, uh, like maybe like four to eight, but five PCs, I would stick like, actually, let me start three to six, four to seven and four to eight It's kind of more what I would actually kind of go with, um, I wouldn't play with more than five PCs and you could get away with playing with two, but um, I really love there to be at least three clocks going at all times. Right. Because uh, that way you have just, uh, uh, you know, uh, three points makes a shape. And if the party goes to deal with this one, then you can decide, does this one get pulled along with it or does it go in its own direction? And what influence does it have on this event? And you have two different axes to shift depending on what happens here at that particular uh, uh, clock dealing. Um, let's see here. Um, so Viking says, fun anecdote from John Harbour. Apparently the whole position effect mechanic comes from him trying to explain fictional positioning in Dungeon World to somebody. So this is something that we talk about. Actually, I've talked about a lot here, which is 
Dungeon World and Powered by the Apocalypse has position and effect. It's just not as mechanically laid out and mechanically identified. Um, so anyways, I would say that this is what I would use here for, I would use for three PCs, three to six clocks, four PCs, four to seven, and five PCs, four to eight. If you are playing with four PCs and, you know, they've got a couple of clocks going and, you know, the number of clocks that they have is like, you know, six, and then they knock one out and they go to five and then they knock another one out four. I, I would start thinking about maybe, you know, oh, and, uh, uh, there's another problem and now you're back up to six clocks. And if they, I don't know, do a ton of work and a bunch of downtown actions and they get down to three, like I, I would try to keep them on their toes. Now I will say that there's a structure to this too that I would follow. Uh, most Forge in the Dark games, and this is a question too, but uh, Forge in the Dark in particular, but Blaze, uh, Powered by the Apocalypse as well. You know, the, the campaigns, uh, I, I, think, I think it's overstated. And I think I've overstated it. So I apologize if I've done this. They don't have to be short, okay? They don't have to be short, okay? Uh, uh, but I, I really don't think they could be long either, okay? So, you know, I think, I think short to middle, uh, to, to mid, you know, is reasonable. I think you can do, you know, a 20 or maybe even a 30 session Forge in the Dark or Blaze in the Dark game if you have characters, if you have PCs who are willing to actually embrace the rules of Forge in the Dark and Blaze in the Dark games, which is to say um, Forge in the Dark or Powered by the Apocalypse games, which is to do things like, you know, playbook switching, okay, where a character sort of changes up their character's identity. Um, things like just straight up new PCs that come in after existing PCs sort of, they did their bid for king and country and they're out. Uh, or maybe they you know died or they retired or they had were forced to retire. So there's different things. But I mean, that being said, when, it, when a campaign first starts out, we'll say, you know, the beginning and then the middle uh, of your game, you know, the number of clocks that you have here you know, might be three to four. And then when you get to the middle part of your campaign, there might be six or seven or eight clocks going. And then you kind of decide, you know what, I'm going to start wrapping things up here. And when you decide that the game is starting to come into its natural conclusion, maybe over the next five to six sessions, don't add any more clocks. Start letting these, you know, wind down a little bit as the clock so that you have, you know, four to five. And then by the end of the campaign, uh, you know, I don't... I, it doesn't have to be a perfect zero, but like you might, you might only have a handful of things that weren't really resolved because the, the PCs through their actions have told you what they cared about. And so, you know, you kind of end up with this structure where the tension kind of increases and then the party becomes more focused and then the campaign ends. And it's not the end of all things, but it is the end of that particular arc or that particular uh, storyline. So good question from London. All right, moving on. Uh, so London has some other ones, but I, I want to get some other people. Um, let's see here. Alderac from the Patreon asks, all right, what makes a good or a bad powered by the apocalypse forge in the dark game? How can you spot a bad one? What makes the good ones out there sing? Oh, drama. Um, all right. So I have a couple of, of, of my per this is my personal belief on, this is my personal take on it, which is, um, for me, is does the game give me levers or resources? And this is key. This is key to in fact, here to to easily handle six minuses and seven to nines. For me, and I think for a lot of people out there, the single greatest challenge for a uh, powered by the apocalypse game is what happens when a PC rolls a six minus and you have to make a GM move. What happens when the PC rolls a seven, eight, and a nine, and they get a mixed success? How do you, how do you quickly rely on that? Well, 
in my experience, there are plenty of games out there, especially some of the newer games out there, Forge in the Dark games do this as well, are very good at giving you levers that you can pull on to make very, very, very easy decisions about seven, eights, and nines. So, like, for example, let me pull up. Um, let's pull up. Uh, do we have playbooks in here? Of course not. Why would they have playbooks in there? Okay. Um, oh, they are in their own book. Okay, here we go. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look here real quickly at... Um, let's go ahead and take a look real quickly at... Avatar Legends, powered by the Apocalypse game. All right. So in Avatar Legends, your character, and this is one of the reasons why I really like this game, okay? Your character has a number of ways that as a GM, we can create problems or issues or complications for them in the event that they roll a six minus or a seven, eight, or nine. For example, we have <clears throat> balance. Now, the big part of Avatar's game is that every playbook has two different principles that they are torn between. In the case of the adamant, you are torn between restraint and results, right? Holding back, getting shit done. So this is the tension between your characters. Well, guess what? One of the moves that you can use as a GM on a seven, eight, or nine, or on a six minus, is you can shift someone's balance, right? And this could be done as a way to uh, indicate to the player that a particular event caused them to sort of feel or, or uh, you know, feel differently about themselves or about the situation. Secondly, we have conditions, afraid, angry, guilty, insecure, and troubled. Not only do these have game effects, you can see them listed below. They give you penalties to doing some of the game's core moves, okay? But, for example, um, a character lies to someone, right? They, they lie to an Earth Kingdom guard, right, that, uh, of course, we're with the Queen's entourage, you fool, right? And he does, you do really, your character's a really good liar, right? And the character rolls a seven- eight or nine. So there's success, but with a complication. So we just say, okay, you, you lie to the character, right? Because as a GM, as a player, I want to see them, the story go forward. Th this is not a moment that I want to get hung up on. So I'm going to say, yep, you succeed. By the way, this is, a, this is a secret trick. This is not fudging. This is not fudging. That PC could roll a six minus. And you, as a GM, could decide, all right, the guard is going to believe you, but it leaves you feeling guilty for what you did, and I'm going to push your balance towards results because your character is kind of getting back into that habit of doing whatever it takes to get the job done, which is a big part of what the Adamant's playbook is about, right? About, like how far are you willing to go to get what you, you know, to get what you want done. So boom, I gave it to them. I gave them success, but I also made them angry or sorry, guilty. And I pushed them towards results. So that's a fantastic way that I can shift and change. And that way as a GM, when you get to one of these weird moments where you're like, uh, what am I doing here? You just go mark a condition. And sometimes I, I might even say like, uh, you know, uh, to the player, hey, I think you should mark a condition. Uh, which one do you think is most appropriate? And the player might say, actually, I don't feel guilty about this. Actually, I'm a little troubled. Like, it should not be this easy to sneak into the Imperial Palace. I'm an Earth Kingdom loyalist. Like, what has become of my beloved nation that everybody is so, you know, uh, easily influenced and corruptible? I go, oh, okay, great. That's 
awesome. We just learned a little bit more about your character and we learned a little bit more about the world from you failing, right? That, that, like that moment there is just so awesome because that's what the player, you know, said. And, and, and they might even bring up a reason for why they're afraid or why they're guilty or whatever. So, uh, or angry. So that's, that's another lever, okay? Then you can see up here at the top, statuses. Now, to be fair, these are more mostly used in the exchange system, but if it seems appropriate that a character should become trapped, you just tell them you become trapped. And then lastly, the most generic of tracks, this is similar to hit points in a way, the, the game also has fatigue, which is just sort of a catch-all. You're not really sure what you should be asking them to do, so have them mark fatigue. So that is sort of the how Avatar, in my, exam, in my particular belief, gives you, as the GM, a ton of tools that you can use to easily handle when someone rolls a six minus or if they roll a, a seven, eight, or nine. Uh, and that is something that, for me, the, the, the more a game makes me kind of go like, ah, I don't have anything that I can just tax, right? If you looked at, like, our Root game, okay? Roots are powered by the Apocalypse game. Characters have an exhaustion track, okay, which is a track of boxes that track how much exhaustion you have left. They have an injury track, which is like how much, you know, actual damage and wear and tear they have on their body. They have depletion, which is like their gear and their supplies and all this other stuff. And then they actually have their, their gear, which has boxes on it that represent how much how much durability is left in their gear. So as a GM, if someone rolls a six minus or seven, eight, nine, I could say, you know what? Uh, it takes longer than you thought. You managed to make it through, but mark a box of exhaustion. And it's like, okay, great, easy. There was a consequence. The character felt the consequence. They didn't get their full success, but this isn't something that I want to focus on because again, as a GM, I can make as hard of a move as I want. And this might not be a scene that I want to spend a lot of time focused on, right? Um, you know, the guard looks at you very, very quizzically when you try to get past him, but he keeps looking down at your, uh, at your wallet or, or at your uh, coin pouch and keeps kind of winking at it. And you realize that with a quick little bribe, you should be able to get through. So this character just failed, right? At their bribe, you know, uh, their, um, maybe at their trick attempt. And I go, if, because sometimes you can phrase it as a question, if you mark two depletion, or one depletion, you can decide as a GM, whatever is good for you. If you mark uh, two depletion, then you, you, you can get by. And then now the character has to make a tough choice. Uh, maybe it's not that tough of a choice, but either way, you put the ball back into their court and they can decide whether they want to succeed or not. You've just given them new standards, new qualifications for what they need to do uh, uh, with you know the training. So that is what I generally look for. The second thing with that I look for um, is I look for a game that handles help slash aiding well. And what does this mean? It means first and foremost, number one priority, okay? No dice roll. Dungeon World, I am looking at you. Dungeon World does not do this. It is terrible. Uh, aid or interfere or whatever. All, any game that uses a die roll for the helping, yeah, hate it. Get it out of here. I've talked on this channel before about how the person rolling the dice, that's their moment. I don't want other people rolling dice while it is that character's moment to shine. So no dice rolls. If someone wants to aid somebody, you just go, hey, this is how I can aid your character. And you go, cool, plus one. Awesome. Great. Number two, um, this is just a personal preference. This is, this is not as imperative as this one is. Number two, uh, help after. I prefer it, and, and this ties into the third reason, which we'll get to in a second. I prefer it when the game allows you to help after the role has made. Okay, so the character rolls their 2d6, they add their stat, they realize I only got a six. I need one more point. And can somebody help me? And that takes me up plus one to the next one. Now, the reason I like that is because I, I hate that feeling. I think it creates a power. 
D and D and RPGs, I should say, not D and D, but uh, RPGs are weird in that if you, 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 it leads to a feeling of helplessness. Almost, it feels like your character is standing by, watching their friend fail. Um, and I don't like that. I like for my players to feel empowered, and I like for them to be able to come in and help out, and you know, kind of save the day, and 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 you know, make something into reality. So. Um, I like for characters to help after. Secondly, it, it's a lot easier. It's quicker because if you try to help before, then the players have to sit there and go, well, should I help before? Should I not help before? Well, what's your bonus? What's your, get rid of all that. Just say like, Hey, I did it. Oh, Hey, I rolled really high. So no one has to worry about it. Hey, I'm too short. Can two people help me? Uh, yeah, I can help you. Oh, I can help you. Great. Cool. And we succeed and we move on, which ties me into the third help at a cost. Okay. In Blades in the Dark, if you want to help some character, if you want to give them a bonus die, it costs you one point of stress. If, going back to Avatar Legends, if you want to aid somebody, help somebody after the die roll, okay, let's take a look here. Boom. Look at this. When you take appropriate action to help a companion, mark one fatigue to give them a plus one to their roll after the roll. So this cover, this, this, this thing here, you can see here, remember too, that we only have five boxes of fatigue, which also are useful for other things that our character cares about. Most importantly, avoiding bad conditions. So there's an inherent cost to helping people. And, um, uh, you know, if you think about that rule, we just read for avatar, there's no dice roll. It, hap it happens after the fact, and it has a cost. Forge in the dark games, um, work, Kind of the same way, but Forge in the Dark games, you have to help them before um, because you have to give them the die before they roll their die pool, which means I prefer something like Avatar's help rule. Avatar's help rule is pretty much the, the example, the pinnacle for me of, of Power by the Apocalypse because it, it meets all three of my goals. So if a game has the tools, the resources, the levers that I can uh, easily handle six minuses and six and seven nines quickly, because I don't always want to have to create some new plot element, and I don't always want to have to create some new NPC or some new clock, okay? Sometimes I just want to be like, you do it, but you're angry now, okay? Moving on, and we move on. Uh, you do it, but you're a little bit exhausted. Mark a point of exhaustion. You do it, but you're you're feeling, you know, kind of bad about it, so, uh, you know, mark guilty. I, I just like it. Sometimes, sometimes it's not something I want to spend a lot of time on, but I don't want to give the character a free lunch. They didn't roll well, and there should be an influence to that. And sometimes it it might turn into a little bit of moment, you know? Um, Beowulf says, in Blaze of the Dark, you don't roll to help. No, you just say, I'm giving you a die and you mark a point of stress. And, you know, you should do it in the fiction. You should explain why you're giving them a bonus die. But yeah. Um, okay. So that's a great question from Alderac. Uh, all right. Um, here we go. Now, Dr. Waits has some interesting questions because he has uh, uh, some, some problems that I have uh, not experienced as much. And we, we can get into some of these. But um, So Dr. Waits asked, how do you know how soft or hard a move you should do as a GM? My PBTA games are usually cakewalks. But this, by the way, if you've been paying attention tonight, then you should already understand probably what is the main problem here, okay? Or, or what is the main issue? Or what is going, uh, you know, what's a, what's a play here? Anybody want to anybody wanna take a guess? Um, I'll let the chat guess. Uh, Gonza says the mentality. That's exactly right. Um, it is exactly Gonza. Gonza got it exactly right. Um, which is, and again, I'm not, I am definitely not insulting anybody here. This is totally reasonable. Um, this mindset is coming from a challenge based mindset. You like, uh, again, I, I'm not, I, I play a lot of D&D. &D. I played a lot of Pathfinder. And there's a certain aspect, I think we can all agree that this is true, that I view myself as the opposition. In fact, I view it, like I say, if I don't give my players a challenging time that really is going to 
test their character's abilities or test the player's abilities to come up with clever solutions to crazy problems, right? Or uh, push them to the limit in exploration and dungeon, right? If I don't push, I feel like I am not doing my job as a, as a DM, okay? And I think that's true to a certain extent. I know that we say that these games aren't competitive, but there's an element there where you feel like your role is to be the provider of the challenge, right? Powered by the Apocalypse games are not that way. It, sh it doesn't matter whether your game was a easy cakewalk or if it was, uh, you know, super duper uh, hard. Was the story that you all created fun? Was the story that you all created entertaining? Did everybody laugh? Did everybody groan? Did everybody, right? Did everybody have a moment? Did everybody get a cool moment to demonstrate and show their characters? I mean, look at the questions that are usually asked at the end of a Powered by the Apocalypse game. And by the way, I should note, I think in this individual, um, uh, uh, Dr. Waits, I think that they have mostly played Dungeon World. And here's the deal about Dungeon World. I think Dungeon World was revolutionary. I think it was critical. I think it, I think it, it is why Powered by the Apocalypse is as popular as it is today, even though, you know, the game was created as Apocalypse World. It is Dungeon World that put it on the map. But I think that there are a lot of problems, okay, that extend from Dungeon World into people's experiences with Powered by the Apocalypse because of the connotation of D&D &D and because there are certain elements within Dungeon World that were them attempting to sort of interject D&D &D into a Powered by the Apocalypse framework in a very, you know, obvious and almost um, clumsy way to make it fit. And so it, it doesn't fit as well. So, you know, my, my answer to this is, now, now the question of how do you know how how soft or hard to move as a GM? Now that is a valid question. Okay, that is a totally valid question, and you know the answer there is, and I would usually say this, which is, uh, it's a combination of things. Really, uh, let me hop into chat real quick, see what everybody's talking about here. Um, Let's see. Da, da, da. Sean says Dungeon World with Avatar Legends combat would be so cool. Uh, I agree, Sean, and it's something that I'd love to work on. Um, uh, aid is just counter spell for normies. I actually kind of agree with that. Actually, that's very sweet. Um, because you know, like, okay, let me get, I promise you that this has happened many times in my, uh, times of playing games. If I describe that a rolling wake of fire is descending from the dragon's mouth onto the cleric and the rogue, okay? And, you know, the cleric says, I stand in front of the rogue and I raise my holy shield and I'm going to defend us. And I say, awesome, cleric, roll with constitution. And they roll a nine. When the wizard comes in from a distance and I describe how the flames are about to hit the cleric, okay, and then, a, you know, the, the wizard is there holding his staff and there's like that blue shield around them that's vaguely translucent. And you can see the fire slicking off of it like water around the cleric and the rogue. And the wizard has all they've done there is aid. But on screen in the movie, it looks fucking sweet. Like it is awesome. Like that is the kind of like moment where you as a player, like there are times when I watch movies and I go, that was awesome, but all it was was like an aid, like a plus one to what plus one to that person's result. And you're like, like an, because the fiction can be way cooler than the mechanic. Just because the mechanic isn't cool doesn't mean that the moment, the fiction can't be amazing and awesome. So um I, I'm a big fan of that. But anyways, um, so I agree that aid is counterspell for normies. Um let's see here. Uh Gold a Cat could not answer because they were busy buying avatar legends <laughs> nice <laughs> um pumpkin getting it right is not supposed to be challenging the traditional way it's made for fun and entertainment um 
Listening to the concept of the balance tracks in Avatar again makes me think you could do the same between the normal and eclipse states in uh, Girls by Moonlight. Going to look at the playbooks again via that lens. Awesome. Yeah, I definitely think that's amazing. Um, I feel that even in Powered by the Apocalypse, if I just get everything I want, that's a bit boring. So I may not want challenge in a traditional sense, but I would want adversity. Todd, I could not agree with you more. In fact, remember, uh, for the most part, unless you're eh, pretty much every PBTA game that I'm aware of, uh, you know, a GM's, uh, one of the GM's main goals, or, or I should say one of the main uh, GM's agenda is fill the PC's lives with adventure, danger, excitement. So I completely agree with you. I am, that is, that is my fundamental drive when I am doing this. I am always looking for things that are going to make the PC's lives be filled with adventure, danger, and or excitement. And so when I make a move, the answer of how do I know how hard or soft or move to make, the answer is quite simple. What is going to make this story more feral? What is going to make this story more interesting? What is going to take this story in a more interesting, fun, dangerous, exciting direction? And that is, um, you know, really what guides me in that sense. Now, on a more prosaic level, and I think it goes without saying, because most people know this, um, typically speaking, um, you know, a soft move, okay, is a setup. And that leads to a soft move that is ignored or denied leads to a hard move, okay? Same thing with what we call golden opportunities. When a, when a player gives you a golden opportunity, you can make a hard move move. And I should remember, I should always point out a, a hard move is as hard as you would like. So example, a great example of a soft move is, all right, as you begin moving into the cavern, you can see dozens of goblins scurrying on the other side. You hear twang, 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 as black wooden bows suddenly clang out and the air is filled with the shafts of dozens of arrows. This is a soft move. I haven't done anything. All I have done is introduce an element to the game. Remember as a GM, this is another common misconception. I, I think people forget all the time. When does the GM make a move? A lot of people say when the players roll a six minus, that is true. But that's not the only time that the GM makes a move. The other time that the GM makes a move is when the players look to you and ask, what happens or what is going on? Then it's your time to make a move. Guess what? That happens all the time in Power by the Apocalypse or in RPGs, right? So when the players say, hey, we're going to enter into the cavern, what do we see? They are actually taking the control. They have the, they have the baton. They have the conch, all right? And they are passing it over to you because the player is the protagonist. They get to decide where the action goes. They want to enter into the chasm. They want to enter into the cavern there. They willingly take their their um, their agency by asking, we're going into this area. They are giving it over to you as the game master. Now you get to make a move. Now, because a hard move should follow from a soft move, the most appropriate thing to do in these instances is to make a soft move, which is to set something up. In this case, I have revealed an unwelcome uh, whatever the dungeon world term is, um, revealed a, an, an unwelcome danger. This room is full of goblins and they are shooting arrows at you. But this move is only a setup because I haven't done anything. I haven't done damage to you. I haven't mechanically affected your character. Now, when I ask you what you do, your character can decide what they want to do. Depending on what they do, I may call for a move or I might just say, you have given me a hard, hard, golden opportunity and you know, you get hit by some arrows. I can make as hard of a move as I want. So that is kind of generally speaking how I think of soft moves and hard moves. I mean, we could spend a lot more time on hard, hard and soft moves, but, you know, I do want to get to uh, try to get to at least every one of everybody's questions. And then we have to do a example campaign creation. So, you know, that'll be pretty good here. Um, let's see here. 
uh, Vorpal Sword of Whacking. Asks, are Forge in the Dark empowered by the Apocalypse games? But in terms of my curiosity, mostly blades. <laughs> Uh, suitable for a West Marches-ish style of players with rotating roster players. Yes. Um, in fact, uh, I think the idea of having a character uh, in Blades in the Dark, uh, having multiple characters in Blades in the Dark, making the crew of your of your you know of your gang or whatever bigger, it makes a lot of sense. In fact, there are rules in Blades in the Dark for when one of your character, you know, the heat is getting too high on your gang. There's been too many uh, uh, witnesses and too many corroborating statements. You can send one of your PCs to jail for a number of sessions. So yes, absolutely. I think that uh, Blades in the Dark games are particularly uh, made well made for this. Uh, Forge in the Dark games in particular, but Blades in the Dark games in particular, Band of Blades would do really, really well for this as well. Um, so both of those games are designed around the idea that you have this crew of people. And so, you know, you could do that with like um, Scum and Villainy, but with Scum and Villainy, uh, it depends on the size of your ship. One of the modes of Scum and Villainy, you're on like a, a big Imperial cruiser type thing. So that would have a lot more characters to it. Um, Gold the Cat says, oh, I'm not sure I agree regarding Band of Blades. Well, Gold the Cat, but you play as different PCs every single time. Like you already play as, as different characters each time, right? So yeah, like you wouldn't have the ability to like have them be do different things in time, but like you could definitely have them be like, yeah, hey, like while you were doing, you know, uh, oh, you mean like a complete open sandbox? Yeah, 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 no, no. Uh, well, he said Western March's style of play with rotating roster of players. If you're being like open exploration, do whatever you want. No, Band of Blades is not good at that. Band of Blades has a very specific uh, timeline of the army has to get back to Sky Dagger Keep before the, you know, uh, apocalypse happens, basically. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's really good. Are there any, uh, now that being said, PBTA games, hmm, I'm less, I'm less likely to say yes to PBTA games. PBTA games are more, more about the interpersonal character relationships um, and, uh, there isn't that idea of like you have a crew of characters, but I, I still don't be, be, because you know be, be because there's uh not like really levels in these games. I think it, I think it could work pretty fine. Um, so you know, are there any specific pitfalls um, to look out for? Uh, no, again, again, Blades in the Dark in particular is pretty well suit set up to take advantage of this. So I think that, that could be really good. The other thing that's great about blaze in the dark is like, you know, you could, assuming you want to do it at like different time zones or different time plays, but you could also have like, if a character can't get caught up in temporal time, right. And so they end up, you just say, Hey, look, you, I know you couldn't play for the last couple of weeks and everybody else has is three weeks in the future. I'm just going to give your character four downtime actions. Is that, cool. And then you can advance to the present. So you weren't out doing scores. You weren't out doing stuff. You were hard at work doing something and you know, you didn't get to play as a player. That kind of sucks, but here's some extra downtime actions and then you can catch up. So, and, and, and get to do some cool stuff anyways. And we can just quickly handle that at the beginning of a session or online or over discord. So I think that's uh, you know, that's probably pretty good. Um, so good question from a verbal sort of whacking. Um, Let's see here. How are we doing? <clears throat> also, I mean, chat, let me know, you know, uh, if there's any, if I say something, if it doesn't make sense, you know, try to try to make me aware of it, you know? Um, okay. Let's see here. So next question. Um, uh, next question. What's going on? Select it, please. All right. All right. How do you design enemies? 
many PBTA games, I'm thinking Monster of the Week and also Forge in the Dark, like Scum and Villamy, don't have best juries or really much guidance in creating opponents. The answer for me here is I don't. Um, when I play Forge in the Dark or Scum and Villainy, um, I basically, I, I, I pretty much, uh, if I want to create somebody that's going to require, you know, okay, number one, when I'm playing Scum and Villainy, most of the time, if I have an NPC, um, and the players shoot him with a blaster, uh, if they roll well, he's dead. Um, <laughs> like, uh, there, there, there's some caveats to that, but like, I'm not tracking his hit points if that's what you mean. Um, because I'm just like, you know, yeah, you just shoot him in the chest and he's dead. Um, I might say that like, you know, he's highly skilled and he pulls out his gun to shoot you first. And the character says, no, I'm going to resist that consequence. And I'm going to shoot him in the face first. And I said, okay. And then they roll and they roll well and they push their effect and they get, great effect or critical effect. And I go, yeah, okay. He's dead. Um, uh, so I don't really track that, but that being said, I mean, other than that, you just, you know, you create a four clock or you create a six clock and you say how, how strong, how many, how many, how much time at the table, how much energy at the table do you, I want to have them spend, uh, you know, dealing with this, um, uh, with this threat. And you can just, Every time they make a success, remember in, in Blades in the Dark, uh, uh, limited is one tick. Standard is two ticks. Great is three ticks, and extreme is five ticks. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, that works out pretty well. Now, obviously, in a game like Dungeon World, you have you know basically hit points. I think Monster of the Week and obviously apocalypse world, you know, they have like the, the harm clock or whatever. Um, so uh, I, I don't really, uh, I don't really focus on that. And then the other thing is too, is like in terms of designing them, I just follow the fiction. Uh, you know, I see Golda cat says here, you know, uh, you know, if I have a crocodile, you know, what does a crocodile do? Well, I, you know, I don't know, bites people or rips them to pieces hurls their body across the, 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 the room and they go cartwheeling. Um, you know, they splash their tail. They disappear into the water. They have thick scaly skins. They get you in the crocodile death roll thing. I am just going to make that character come to live in the fiction and then just, you know, uh, uh, go after you that way. So I don't really care about, you know, what that is about. Um, uh, Gonza says it's all about the fiction. The 16 hit point dragon article is a must read. Uh, the person who wrote it uh, ended up designing Scum and Villain. Yeah. So Strauss uh, uh, Akimovich wrote that and it's a fantastic look it up 16 hit point dragon. And basically it's about the idea that if you look at the stats in dungeon world, okay, the, you know, basically the, the, the big scary, you know, the, the red dragon um, in the monster book has 16 hit points and somebody like a fighter with, hack and slash, which is like the basic combat move does something like, I don't know, like can do like D 10 plus two damage. And so you're just like, okay, so, um, what's the deal? This dragon's just dead in, in two rounds, but this article does a really good job of it. And there's been other articles that explained this before, which is that, you know, a lot of times, you know, this is, this is one of the reasons I do have a problem sometimes with D and D games, you know, what people are describing as, is hack and slash isn't hack and slash. If, if you are a character with a sword and you run up to a 30, you know, if you run up to smog, you know, with a sword, you don't get to attack. You don't get to roll, to hit, to do damage. Are you crazy? Are you kidding me? Of course, that's not hack and slash. Hack and slash is, implies that you and your foe are evenly matched and you're going back to, you know, tit for tat. It's like a, a sparring round in a, in an MMA fight or a boxing match. You going up against a dragon with a sword in your hand is not hack and slash. It's not same thing, by the way, the other side of it. And the book does disclaim this, which is all right. If there's an enemy and you creep in and he doesn't know you're there. You spring from the shadows and stab him in the back with your knife, a dagger. 
That's not hack and slash either. That's not an attack roll either. That's not even a damage roll. He's just dead. I mean, you know, Smaug destroyed an entire civilization of men and dwarves. He burned Lake Town to the ground. He was the greatest of the great worms out of the withered heath of the north. And he got killed with one shot from an arrow. How many hit points did he have? Was Smog a bitch? No, Smog was awesome. And, you know, that, that scene is amazing. But it's because I don't want my monsters, I'm not there to make them a challenge. I'm not there to make them uh, 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 an appropriate CR balanced encounter. I'm there for it to be entertaining. And I'm there to create amazing, awesome moments. And yeah, that that's that's all probably pretty good stuff there. So um, let's see here. Uh, next question. And I know Dr. Waits has a couple more here. Um, so I, I do want to, I do want to address some of these here specifically. Uh, Dr. Waits also asks with plus one forward plus X for ability scores plus Y from advanced moves. It's pretty common for my characters to get plus three or plus four for certain moves. They span these over and over to the point where they seem to have little chance of failure. There would be sessions where characters wouldn't get XP for failing a roll because they never failed. How do you keep the game challenging? So I think this is a, there's a couple of key points to, uh, to, to note about this. Number one, uh, dungeon world is bad. Now I, I love the game and I, think it's fantastic. But the fact of the matter is it was trying too much to be like D&D. Almost every modern PPTA game caps stats at plus two. And there might be a, a move as in like one of the five moves that you get in the entire game that takes one stat to plus three. And that is the only way that you can get to plus three. So you know, and Dungeon World also follows like the, you know, it's D&D. So you get stuff like, oh, he's got a plus one sword, a plus two sword. He's plus four strength and he's got a plus one advanced move. And now he has a plus six. And that is, that is problematic. Now, that being said, when characters do get to a high score of, let's say you said here, plus three with certain moves, you are right. Because on 2d6, that means that they will only get a six minus on a two or a three. Which means that that will only happen three out of 36 times, right? Or one out of 12 times. So what is that, 8%? So number one, they have an 8% chance of completely failing. But then also, they will get a seven, eight, or nine on a four, five, or six. And that is still partial success. If you're hack and slashing and you, and you have a plus three bonus and you roll a four, five, or a six, you are going to end up with a seven, eight, or nine. And that means that they take damage and you take damage, right? It's a give and a take. And a four, five, and six is going to happen. Three plus four is seven plus five. That is going to happen 12 out of 36 times or one third. So there's 33% chance of success with a complication. So even when a character is the theoretical best that they can be, they still have a 41% chance of either creating a failure condition, AKA a full GM move or creating a partial success, which could create its own, you know, uh, problems. You might take damage. You might have additional complications. You might have a, a soft move made to you. So yes, this can happen, but it really should not happen that much. And if it does happen, it should only be with one specific type of ability. And even when it's the highest it possibly could be, uh, you still have a 41% chance of failing. Um, so that that is kind of my, my take on that. Um, now, with all of that being said, if you are playing a PBTA game or a Forge in the Dark game, and your characters have plus three, plus two, plus two, plus one. Those are their four stats. And in Forge in the Dark, they've got, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of the games here. Um, you know, they have Prowl, three dots, um, 
uh, you know, I, I don't remember all the freaking moves in scum these games. Um, they've got scrap three dots. They've got consort two. They've got sway three. Okay. Your characters are going to be rolling a lot of dice and your characters are going to have some pretty good bonuses. And guess what? You are right. The game is going to become easy to a certain extent. And you know what? That just means that your game's probably either, it's probably time to wrap your game up. It's probably time to be on the, cul the culmination side of things. If you're finding that the game, again, remember, your goal isn't to challenge them. It's not to challenge them. It's to entertain them. If your group is only entertained by challenges, then it's probably not the right game because these games aren't designed to be challenging. They're not designed to be balanced, fair, or challenging. So if that is what your sort of metric is, you're going to have a lot of problems. But that being said, I, I'm, you know, I believe that after 10 sessions, but certainly after 20 sessions of most Forge in the Dark or Blades in the Dark games, characters are going to be pretty powerful and might have a very easy time with a good chunk of tasks in the game. And that's going to make the game, you know, which is, by the way, perfect. Mm. It's so good. Because do you remember earlier what we were talking about? Where we talked about how at the beginning of the game, right? Remember the beginning, the middle, and the end of your campaign, right? You might start off with, you know, uh, three clocks, and then it expands to six. And by the end of the game, it's down to basically zero clocks. Well, guess what? When your characters are succeeding a lot and they're not creating complications and they're not creating consequences, that's a great way for these clocks to get resolved without creating new ones or new problems because your characters basically are built to start resolving all the issues so that your campaign can end in a nice tidy fashion. And then once all of the issues have been resolved, the characters have accomplished everything that they were set out to accomplish. That's when that campaign ends and maybe another one begins, or maybe uh, you do a spinoff, but you know, that's sort of your, your time to say, Hey, it's time to go. All right. Um, Morgan asks, um, what are some good ways to get players? What are some good ways to get players used to fantasy D20 games to adjust to Blades in the Dark style games? When I tried running Icon, which is like a like Lancer, right? Where it's like it uses Blades in the Dark for not combat and uses like fourth edition for combat. Every player loaded up on sense or its closest equivalent to perception and wanted to roll that constantly. Struggle to get across to them that you don't roll if it's not meaningful. You just get the information you seek. Yeah, I mean, some of it comes, again, There, there is the idea that, you know, D&D &D players, you know, D20 players think that they take a mechanical action on their sheet. That creates a die roll. And then that leads to the fiction. But in PBTA or Forge in the Dark, we have the fiction first. This is what the, why, the, why they call it fiction first gaming. And as we are talking, a mechanical trigger may occur and then we do a dice roll and then we go back to the fiction so that's the kind of the key distinctive difference here you know um and i think it really comes down to the fact that again bad name i mean i'm sorry vincent baker i don't think you should have called them moves i i, I, I think moves is a bad term for them because it makes it seem like it's a a button that you push on your character sheet. And that's not the way that it happens, right? You, the way that you play Powered by the Apocalypse or Fortune in the Dark is you have these conversations in the fiction and it's not the GM that makes a move. It's not the player that makes a move. 
it's the move itself triggering it, it if we had some like ai chat bot okay the way that a blades in the dark game would actually look like is you and i would just be talking back and forth and i'd be saying stuff and you'd say stuff and i'd say so i'm the gm by the way i'm the gm you're the player we're just going back and forth you're saying something i say something you say something i say something you say something kind of dramatic or important and i start to talk but then some third party ai bot goes bram, bram, move triggered and then it goes and it brings up like a little window and the player goes oh shit i have to roll with my wits and then they roll and we all wait to see what happens does the player get what they want or do i as a gm get what i want or get get to do something that i want to do but like neither of us did the move the move just triggered all right the, I, the best way that you could probably play a power in the apocalypse game is the gm and the players don't actually know any of the rules they just talk and then like somebody who knows all the rules like me is like standing off to the side with like a whistle and then like i just watch the you know the conversation and then i'll whistle in and go like stop that's a move make your roll and then they go oh oh okay and then they make the roll and i go okay gm's ball make your move play continues and then i whistle again and we keep going on and then i let the players play so it's like there's three there's sort of three axes in in a powered by the apocalypse game you have the players or the pc you have the gm and then you have the rules the rules are sort of their own thing you know um that's kind of a, a weird way of thinking about it but yeah you know we talk about pyramids and stuff like that so it's like you have the gm you have the players and then the rules aren't with the players they're not with the gm the rules are their own thing remember the gm is beholden to the rules as well uh yeah sean says I'm, yeah I, in this case you would have the gm and then you would have the referee <laughs> now it's interesting sean that you call that a referee because i would say that obviously your table is never going to have a literal rules referee um standing out right um instead everybody at the table is the referee because you're, you're not, you're not going to have an actual third party person who's watching your game, calling out the rules. So who is the referee? Everybody, everybody. Oh, GM Scott has a great example of here, which is like in the avatar game. Uh, I played avatar legends with GM Scott at origins game fair, uh, game con Aaron, right. And me, uh, Aaron was playing his, um, fire nation, kind of ex-military guy, Firebender. And I was playing uh, the, uh, as a GM, I was playing the NPC of a rogue Fire Nation general who refused to surrender after the Fire Lord's defeat. And he and I were having a conversation. We we're just talking in the fiction. And it was GM Scott, who's brand new to the game, by the way. So shout out to GM Scott for picking up on this. But you know, this is, this is what, when a game makes sense and you've got good quality players, this is what can happen. He pointed out, not me, not the game master, not the other player. We're busy just talking. We're almost getting too caught up in our conversation. And GM Scott says, look, I, that sounds mighty convenient. That would be awesome if he would go with it. But you don't get to make that decision, Aaron. Neither do you, game master. The game cares about this. And so there's a rule for this. And in this particular instance, this rule is called calling, um, uh, 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 calling someone out and we can look at it here okay and it says when you openly call on someone to live up to their principle shift away from their balance and roll with their principle in other words i don't call someone out what i do is you know when we're playing and it's like you know um the fire nation general turns to you and says you swore an oath to your people to your land to this nation that you would defend it unto its death. Here we stand in Fire Nation territory, earned by the blood of our brothers and sisters who fought, who claimed this land in the name of that nation. And now you would tell me to, to just walk away from that? Where do your loyalties lie? And, you know, Aaron started to say something, and GM Scott was like, wait a second, uh, sorry, is, is, is he calling on Aaron to live up to his principle? And Aaron and I looked down at his character sheet and we're like, yes, he absolutely is. And so instead of getting to just keep talking back and forth, fluffy bullshit time, everybody just makes up whatever's good, we stop because that would be boring. The dice are going to get involved. And that means 
We don't know what's going to happen here. Aaron doesn't know what's going to happen here. Is he going to get called out? Is he going to be able to live up to his principle? Is he going to uh, you know, fall apart like a house of cards? We don't know. And that's what makes the game so interesting. Um, but yeah. Uh, let's see here. Um, so that is my take on, you know, getting that across in terms of the understanding the, the relationship between the rules, the GM and the players. Um, you know, to be honest with you, I'm trying to remember how that happened. Um, Cause I'm, I, you know what? Let me, let me see. Do I have the books here? Hold on a second. I'm not sure which character. Let me see if I can find his, let me see if I can remember which, if I can remember which playbook Aaron had. Um, didn't have the guardian. I didn't have the hammer. I don't remember. He might have been. I don't know. He might have been the icon now that I think about it. Yeah. So, anyways, um, yeah, I think he, he, I don't remember if he was the icon. Oh, I think actually Steven from Roll for Combat was the icon. I don't remember. I don't remember what playbook he was. Anyways, sorry, getting distracted. Um, yeah, it it, uh, it 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 was an awesome moment. Red Matter. I mean, we we the whole night was full of awesome moments, and it's just you know awesome. It was it was a great play experience. I got to play it with a bunch of patrons from Knights of Last Call, including Stephen from uh, Roll for Combat. Um, that was awesome. Yes, Stephen was the budgetar. Yeah, okay, he was the budget avatar. <laughs> you know, because in Avatar Legends, you don't actually get to be the avatar. All right. Um, I don't know what else I would call them either, Viking. I I I, I can't like. I just feel like the the name gives people the wrong idea. To be clear, Viking. By the way, I think a lot of the terminology in Powered by the Apocalypse is really poopy, poopy doo doo. Um, I think plus one forward is the most horrible gamist. Plus one ongoing hold three. All that nomenclature that the game uses, I think, is caca. I think it's actually pretty terrible. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm so used to it at this point. I just, I just get it. But like when you're new to the game, you're like plus one forward. Why is it called that? Like I, I get what they were trying to do, but I think they were trying to be a little bit too indie and hip when, when he wrote this and, and then everybody copied it. And now it's just part of the DNA of power by the apocalypse. And it's, it's, it's not a great thing. Um, Let's see here. Oh, hey, Sean. Sean with a super chat says, oh, $20 for the budgetar. <laughs> um, yeah, that was a that was a, a completely that was a fun. Everybody had really, really awesome characters. And, you know, I, I never play Powered by the Apocalypse with like more than like I try not to play with more than four people, five at most. I think we had seven people, but everybody had a really great, you know, uh, uh, things. Yes. Uh, I love how Sean knows. He didn't even play. He showed up late. Yeah, this is a great point. Sean, who just tipped us for $20. Thank you so much, Sean, was was there for this entire session, but he showed up a little late. We had already started playing, and I was like, sorry, like we're already kind of at max here. And he goes, that's fine. You know, he was really gracious about it. And he goes, I'm just going to watch. And he was like sitting there like, wow, this is like this is like a great show. Like none of you have played this game before. None of you have played this system before. Very few of you. Uh, only maybe like Aaron and, and maybe like, maybe like Dan or something had played uh, powered by the apocalypse before. And it was great. Um, uh, is it a 2d six system? Walter? Yes, it is. Uh, but to be fair, Walter, we are talking about forged in the dark and powered by the apocalypse. Powered by the apocalypse is 2d six plus a modifier. And then if you roll a six or less, so uh, two, three, four, five, or six, you get, uh, what we well we'll call it a downbeat. In other words, the story changes and not for the better. If you get a seven, eight, or nine, you get a mixed beat, right? Something happens that is good for you, but something happens that is not so good for you. And if you get a ten or higher, you get an upbeat. It's it's all smooth sailing. You get everything you want. The world is your oyster. In Forged in the Dark games, you assemble a dice pool of D sixes. So you might only roll one D six, or you might roll three D six, or you might roll four D six. You're going to roll all those dice. And then you're going to look for which die is the highest value. 
You're not adding anything. You're just looking to see out of all the dice I just rolled, what is the highest value? Obviously, if you're rolling 1d6, it's just that die. But if you're rolling 3d6, you'd look and see what is the highest value on my, on my dice. If the highest value on your dice is a six, then you get an upbeat. If the highest value on your dice is a four or a five, you get a mixed beat. And if the highest value on your dice is a one, two, or three, as you can guess, it is a down beat. So they are very similar in execution, but, uh, or sorry, very similar in outcome, but they are very different in execution. But the odds actually kind of work out to be about the same. So it kind of works out the same. Um, let's see here. Um, yeah, hold three, hold three. What? Yeah. I, I probably had that ans I probably had that asked or to me like more times than anything else in power by the apocalypse. Um, work is going late. Did you cover the minimum prep and knowledge of the rules? A new blades in the dark GM needs to run the game. I was just thinking me and my players could just stumble through it. Um, my, I'm tempted to say it is not that much, but I, I do think that you have to understand the fundamental, not the mechanics of the game. You have to understand the fundamental principles of the game. If you can understand those, then you can run the game basically with just like, you know, make everything standard risky or make everything defy danger and you'll be fine. Um, all right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go till about nine o'clock and then we're going to do a, a, a character or a, a mini campaign creation. Okay. Um, I think we're getting near to the end of it. Um, so Colin, by the way, asked, how do you keep player progression for basically end of the game? Because their bonuses break the math. You don't. I mean, that's, that is pretty much what happens in these games. Um, if, but again, challenging should not be your goal. Entertainment should be your goal. As people are having still fun and they're still finding joy in their, in their game. Then, you know, you're fine. Um, Isaiah says, do you have any tips for managing the alternate and opposite opposing factions and their agendas in blades in the dark? So I'm not going to skip Isaiah's question. Um, but I will say that we'll kind of cover this a little bit when we talk about the campaign creation. But long story short, if you go to Blades in the Dark book, um, I mean they they kind of tell you what the game, what the what the rule, what the the uh, the factions are after. Um, let me bring this up here. Blades in the Dark. All right, let's get the PDF up. All right, so like if we look at uh, here we go, if we look at the factions, um, here is the Bill Hooks. They are a tough gang of thugs who prefer hatchets, meat hooks, and pole arms. Yikes! Their faction clock is an eight clock. They terrorize magistrates to pardon members in prison. So that is what the Bill Hooks are trying to do. So assuming the PCs were running afoul of the bill hooks, you might have an eight clock that you make in your game and it's called uh, bill hooks uh, terrorize magistrates. And that's, that's your, that's it. That's, that's your, that's your clock. And now the PCs, especially if they're running against it, they might know about this. Um, and so what ends up happening is uh, you just, you just, again, remember one of the things I talked about before, think off screen too. Sometimes when I am running, when I am running a, again, remember the dice rolls in powered by the apocalypse and Forge of the dark games are not physics simulators. Okay. A, a character in blades in the dark could fail a roll to try to attune to the ghost field of a, of a haunted mansion. And as a result of that consequence, you could tick a clock on the bill hooks, terrorize magistrates. Now that's probably not the absolute best example in the history of the game, but I'll tell you what, sometimes it is what you do. And sometimes it's, you need to do it. 
because you sometimes you need to think off screen too. We'll get into this, but like if you're on a score in Blaze in the Dark and you just keep creating problems for the party, they will never get out of the score. And, and let me tell you something, your Blades in the Dark game, your Scum and Villainy game will be better if you can do at least two, but ideally three scores, all right? Per session. I cannot stress this enough. Scores do not have to take up the whole session. They should not take up the whole session. If my, if my characters get two, I'm a little disappointed. I'm really aiming for three. Four is okay too if if some of them are just like super quick. So, anyways, um, but yeah, Isaiah, uh, there's a lot of um, information about the factions here in the back. Um, like some of them have multiple clocks. The Church of Ecstasy wants to unlock the secret of ascension and eliminate the reconciled. I don't know exactly what that means. I know a little bit about the Church of Ecstasy, but not enough to be able to answer all of those stuff. Um, and so, yeah, we just kind of kind of go from there. Um, all right. Um, all right. Uh, ooh, I never even noticed that. All right. Well, great. Um, the option to just tick a clock in blades is so nice. Sometimes fights in PBTA just never end. Viking, there's a lot of reasons I love Power by the Apocalypse. It's true. But I probably love Forge in the Dark a little bit more. And to be fair, you can do this in Power by the Apocalypse. When a character creates a six minus, just make a hard move and advance a front or tick a clock. You could have clocks in Power by the Apocalypse. There's there's no reason uh, that you can't. Um, but because they're so integral to Forge in the Dark, it feels more natural. And for me, I just, you know, I think about um, uh, the consequences that happen when a uh, an action is rolled and you generate problems or consequences. And boom, you know, we 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 just kind of figure out, you know, what what what's going to happen as a result of the effect. And so, like again, I mean, if we look over at you know, in Blades in the Dark, but this is true for all Forge in the Dark game. Um, when a character gets a, a doesn't get a perfect roll, these are the five outcomes. They can do reduced effect. They can, there's a complication. There's a lost opportunity. There's worse position or there's harm. Well, complication is by far the most uh, broad of the sorts. And, you know, this represents trouble, mounting danger, or a new threat. The GM might introduce an immediate problem that results from the action right now, such as the room catches fire. Okay, that's fine. But remember, if you keep doing this, nothing's ever going to get resolved. Or you also might tick a clock for the complication instead. Maybe there's a clock for the alert level at the mayor. Maybe there's a new clock for suspicion. Maybe there's a clock for a minor compl uh, complication. So the idea that you could just tick a clock that's off screen works really, really well. Now, again, sometimes I, I still think it's better to try to keep it, you know, somewhat tied to the, uh, to the, to the extent at hand. So for example, if we were going up against uh, the, you know, for example, let's say that we were going up against the bill hooks and we rolled a complication against them. You know, I might say, you know, after this is all said and done, the bill hooks realize that they need to uh, double redouble their efforts and they're going to push even harder um, on the, you know, on the magistrates or, you know, the, 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 the violence inherent in these, in the, in the street war between you and the bill hooks pushes, uh, their agenda even further. I'm going to tick the clock again. And by the way, remember when I tick a clock off screen, when I tick a clock off screen, that was a consequence. And guess what that means you can do in blades of the dark people or scum and villainy. You can resist that shit. If you don't want that clock to be ticked, then don't let it be. Um, all right. Moving on. I think we're getting near near the end here. Ish. Um, all right. Boodle, who has an awesome picture of a poodle as their name, um, says... I've heard you mention a couple of times on stream in the cord, the discord, I like calling it in the cord. That's nice that you've had some of your most memorable combats within dungeon world or powered by the apocalypse systems. for you. What makes this sort of combat so memorable or engaging? Could you share an example of a combat that is stuck with you? Well, 
I mean, I don't think you have to look much further. If you want to, if you're a member of the Patreon, unfortunately, this is only for members of the Patreon, but you know, go watch Bob's birthday bash. Um, you know, I don't even have to talk about a game that stuck with me. And this is a game that stuck with Bob. Um, they fight some orcs and it's brutal and it's vicious. Okay. Why do they tend to work really well for me? Well, for starters, I am a big believer that theater of the mind style combat where there's no grid and everything is being done via descriptions uh, just sticks in people's heads more. And part of the reason for this is because I am not a mathematical genius and I don't really care about the precise distances of things anyways when I'm playing theater of the mind. So I don't care if someone's 30 feet away or 25 feet away. You don't even have a speed in these games. But because I want to keep everybody on the same page. Now, if, if we were doing this as a book, it would be annoying. If we were doing this in probably even in an actual play, it would be annoying. But if you watch me play a theater of the mind game, you know what I'm doing a lot? I am repeating information. So, and I'm just looking here in chat at some people. So I might say, okay, Isaiah, uh, you know, you bust into the room. What do you do? And Isaiah goes, you know, I am drawing steel and I'm charging into that band of orcs head on. And I go, great. Okay. Isaiah's charging towards the orc. GM Scott, what are you doing? You're like, uh, well, I'm going to take a look around. Like, is there anything? All right. Um, yeah. GM Scott. All right. So Isaiah's charging orcs. GM Scott kind of moves over to the side to take a look at a better position. Um, GM Scott, you see that there is some large pillars and strange glyphs on the right side of the chamber. Uh, and GM Scott goes, I'm going to make my way over to them. And I'm like, okay, Isaiah is with the orcs. He's now getting there. He's about to clash with them. They've charged forward to meet him. GM Scott has slinked over to the side. All right, London. Uh, while all of this is happening, suddenly a massive ball of fire shoots out of the ground beneath your feet as a massive uh, a fire worm breaks free from the surface. What do you do? And it's like, um, I'm going to leap back. And, you know, so I'm always repeating the, uh, what, what's happening so that everybody's on the same page, you know? Um, so <laughs> GM Scott, I watched him charge in the orcs. Well, that's the other thing, you know, Compi is joking here, of course, but, but, you know, the fact of the matter is, when you don't have initiative order, um, yeah, you can do that because you're not losing out on anything. It's not like you have a limited number of actions. You can wait. It doesn't matter. Um, so for sure. Um, okay, Simon, I still have yet to watch the birthday bash. Hell, the only Patreon video I've seen now thinking about it was the fantastic remaster review, which is a legend. That is a legendary case. Simon. Well, there's a, there is a lot of, there is a lot of um, uh, patron bonus content, but one of them is Bob's birthday bash. So uh, definitely worth checking out. Um, Beowulf, I don't know if you're joking here, buddy. Hard disagree about doing more than one score a session. My preference is one score every two sessions and one downtime every two sessions. Uh, oh, I hope you're joking. Um, one score, one session, then one downtime the next session. No, Beowulf, Beowulf, buddy. No, 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 no. Speed that shit up. Speed that shit up here. You know what? Uh, this is a question that somebody asked me. Um, uh, well, you know what? Maybe it's from the thing. So anyways, um, so theater of the mind, I, I don't want to get distracted. Theater of the mind, no grid. The second is, and I mean, I, I, I'm being a little bit presumptuous here, uh, which is, uh, uh, I think, uh, the stuff we make, is cooler than some game trying hard to be a fantasy tactical combat miniatures game. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, when you play a video game and you're like, oh, I'm in the awesome scene, it's just like, you're just hacking into them, right? The only time you ever do anything cool in video games is like a quick time event. And even then you're just pushing the buttons. And in a game like Pathfinder 2 or D&D, &D, you know, you're like, oh, I swing my sword. Oh, I do the double slice. Oh, I move to the flank and sneak attack. It's like, you just, you know, you're just, you're just doing damage because it's like, it's a combat. It's just a combat miniatures game. I'm not trying to make a combat miniatures game here. I'm trying to create something that's going to look like a movie. Um, and so for me, when, you know, Bob comes up and, 
you know, swings his sword down or axe down at the orc and rolls low, I don't have to just go, he misses. I can say, you know, your orc, the, the axe, you know, sails into the air and then the orc takes his left hand, shoots it up and grabs the half before it makes contact. You know, he stares into your eyes, his blood red eyes burning with rage as he howls. He jerks the axe out of your hand and then with his left foot kicks you and you go stumbling back to the ground, crashing into a nearby table. The table breaks under your weight and you're surrounded by debris. And then, you know, I go, Bob, what do you do? And Bob's not even thinking. He's just playing the game. He goes, I, I, I grab one of the busted table legs and I stand up like a golf swing and just connect with him under his chin. And I go, hell yeah, roll the dice. We are just, you know, we're just going back and forth. We're just, we're not worried about what is allowed by the game. We're not allowed by, you know, we are just going with what would happen in a movie. We are just going by what would happen in a, you know, uh, th uh, go by what would happen in a, uh, a film or a book. You know, one of my best examples is someone, someone actually pointed this out to me once during a Dungeon World game. I think it was a Dungeon World game. Yeah, it was probably a Dungeon World game at uh, like a Gen Con. They were like, you know, like they, they, were, they were probably older than me. Uh, you know, I was probably like 30 at the time. They were probably like 40 at the time. And I was running a Dungeon World game. And I can't exactly remember what the exact consequences was, but their character was like a fighter type, you know, like a kind of like a Conan, the barbarian type, right? Like big and brawling. And he had like a sword and he was clashing with some other creature. And I basically described them as like getting into a clash. Right. And they're, you know, trying to, you know, jury, you know, for position. And then his characters, you know, comes down and I describe as it coming down and I go, what do you do? And he goes, you know, he was describing, he's like, well, my hand is pushing his he goes, I just punch him in the face. And I said, hell yeah, you do. And he rolled and he punched. And I described how's the, you know, I don't know. It wasn't an orc, but let's just say the orc, you know, the orc gets socked in the face and just goes sprawling backwards, letting go and, you know, ending the thing. And the character, he was so typical. He goes, you know, I've been playing D and D for like 30 years and I have never just like punched somebody with my fist in a combat before because it would have been a horrible idea that would never have worked out well and would have been completely game inefficient. He's like, but every Conan, the barbarian novel, every movie I've ever seen where there's swords fighting and they, somebody that people are always getting punched out. People get punched out all the time because your hand is free. Their face is right there. Boom. You hit him in the face because you're in a clash. You're close. The weapons, you know, they're almost more of a liability at this distance than they are in an, an asset. And he was just like, yeah, he's like, that was awesome. Um, so that's why it's more memorable for me, at least uh, in theory. Um, all right. Um, let's see here. Viking says, I don't mind doing a long score if the situation calls for it, but most don't. Yeah, I... I uh, I was going to say, I have an example that somebody asked him. We were playing Scum and Villainy. And the group was like a, uh, you know, they were like a firefly s crew. They were Firefly and the Furious, right? So they were basically, it was the, the plot was basically Firefly meets the Fast and the Furious. They were a bunch of illegal space racers who were using crime not for like nefarious purposes, but just to be rich and wealthy enough that they could outfit their hunk of junk into the fastest hunk of junk in the galaxy, right? So Firefly and the Furious with the goal of, of getting the Millennium Falcon, right? That was like the premise of the campaign, basically. Well, there was a... Uh, a score. The group had, you know, they, they had a lot of... Uh, you know what I'll call, uh, they had a lot of heat. Um, excuse me. They had a lot of um, uh, stress and everybody was kind of like burnt out after a particularly brutal score. And they said, you know what? We just want to take an easy score. And I said, oh, okay. Well, it, you know, it'll just be a little bit of, of light smuggling. You need to transport some goods from one system to another through the jump gate 
and avoid any imperial inspections because this material is not supposed to be. And it was not even like weapons or explosions. It was like, I don't know, it was like some like Altarian spice, you know, it was just something that was a considered contraband. And, um, and they were like, okay, so uh, they, you know, in that game, you have jump gates that, that take you to the next system. And, you know, they came in to the, uh, 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 the, they came into the jump gate and like an Imperial inspector, you know, basically came on the comm screen and was like, you know, um, shuttle, whatever, 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 uh, you know, please identify yourself, whatever. Da. And, and then the character, uh, like one character made like a, you know, a role or whatever like that. And, and like a consort role just to be like, Hey, you know, everything's good. And, he, and then like, they rolled like a complication. I was like, uh, everything seems fine, but just, we need to do a routine inspection just to make sure that there's no, uh, you know, any sort of viruses or anything like that. And the, the smuggler character, the, 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 the kind of Han Solo character who had like really high sway role basically just came in and said, you know what? Uh, my character, I'm going to bring this up here. My character has forged documents. So I am going to use the forged documents and I am going to say that he like flashbacked and said, and I used aura, my info broker to make sure that these were perfect for, you know, this, this week's Imperial cycle. And I have just like a completely, totally real set of, of Imperial customs forms basically. And he goes, so do I roll? I go, yeah, you got to roll, but I'm going to give you controlled position. Great effect. And he goes, great. And he rolled his sway and he rolled well enough that he extreme. I said, he goes, okay, everything's good. Be on your way. Move along, move along. And then I was like, I mean, that's it. I, I don't know. There, why, why would I make up any other things for this score in the fiction? You guys just beat the mission. So I'm, I don't feel compelled to just make shit up to keep the score going. If in the fiction, the, you have dealt with the issue, then it's done. It doesn't matter that it's like, well, everybody didn't get a chance. To, no, like in the fiction, your character had everything that they needed and you rolled well and it was awesome. And everybody's just like, yeah, great. And they're like, the, and the feeling of the crew, you know, the feeling of the play group was we kind of want a shorter score because we kind of just want to, you know, re get some more downtime so we could heal up more. And I was like, I am fine with this. And boom, it was literally a score that took probably less than five minutes. Um, and that includes them coming up with it. You know, it was just like immediate, just boom, boom. Um, all right. Lost my mouse. Hold on a sec. Sorry. Um, Uh, when you play Blaze of the Dark, it was how the GM ran it. It was amazing. One of the most fun I ever had. If it was two or three scores per sessions, I think I would have hated it, or I would have hated it. You know, Beowulf, look, if it works for your group, I think it's great. The only reason I recommend doing multiple scores per session is because the pattern of play that emerges from multiple scores um, and multiple downtime actions per session, I think is really, really important. So, uh, but, you know, if your group is loving it, I mean, that's great. I will also say this. Um, in most plays in the dark game, you know, you, you get stress, right? But you don't get that many stress boxes. You think you get like five or six stress boxes. It's not a ton of stress. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. Yeah. You get like seven stress boxes default or something. And if your score is going for a really long time, then the stress can start to fill up and then your character can't do things as easily. You can't aid people. You can't, um, uh, flashback. And so I like for my scores to be shorter because that way I give my players a chance to indulge vices and, you know, uh, eliminate these between things so we can kind of go again, you know? Um, you know, the way I look at it is like, you know, you could have an adventuring day that is like 12 encounters long in D and D, but you know, by the time you get through the first couple of encounters, everybody's run out of healing surges. If you're playing fourth edition or, you know, like the wizard and the cleric are basically out of spells and they're just kind of sitting there using cantrips and it kind of sucks. Like I like for characters to have their resources enough to keep it fresh, but that's just my personal take. Um, let's see here. Um, 
Are you even playing Scum and Villainy if you aren't doing Firefly? I mean, you can, right? Um, I mean, there are three different ships that you can play in Scum and Villainy. The first is the Star Dancer, which is absolutely the Serenity. Um, in fact, like, even look at, like, the the thing here, you know, like, one of the things is, like, home cooking, uh, you know, that you can basically cook meals for the group. Like, the game, the, the thing starts with a galley, you know, for everybody to hang out and eat food in. It's designed to be, it does, it's a freighter that's been repurposed. But there's also the Cerebrus, which is based off of Cowboy Bebop. Uh, this is where your characters are a uh, bounty hunters, an extraction specialist. So you're a little bit more, uh, you know, kind of run and gun military kind of, uh, you know, stuff like that. And then there's the Fire Drake, which is more like Star Wars, Rebel Alliance. Um, and you're actually on a big kind of capital ship, right? A Corvette. And um, not the biggest of the ships, but you could think of it like the blockade runner from the beginning of A New Hope. Um, and so there's there there are different ways that you can technically play Scum and Villainy. Um, so uh, I agree with Golda Cat. It's important to give players downtime stuff than score stuff because downplay downtime and free play is where the real game happens. I actually kind of agree with you, actually, a lot. <laughs> um, um, let's see here. <laughs> I missed the Firefly RPG. You do Scum and Villainy Farscape style. Ooh, yeah. Shout out to Farscape. All right. Who is your favorite Farscape character? Poll in the chat. Okay, it's obviously not Crichton. Uh, favorite Farscape character. Nobody actually probably even knows these people. Um, was it Rigel? Was it Pauzan? Was it Argo? Or was it, you know what? I'll put in Pilot. All right. Sorry, Aaron Soon. Sorry, Chani. Sorry, Michael. All right. Those are your votes. I only get four people. YouTube will only let me make polls for four people. Um, <laughs> I don't know if anybody even knows who these people is. No, no Scorpius. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, my famous last words are this. I've never actually watched Farscape. It is, for my money, one of my favorite shows. I love, I love Farscape. It's weird and it's wacky and I'm okay with it. You know, it is not, uh, it is not for the faint of heart, but it is a great show. Um, you know, I love, I love, it was all practical effects. It was Jim Henson. It was real mup is real puppets, real mup. You know what I mean? It wasn't all CGI bullshit. I loved it. Like, that's actually what I liked about it. I liked that everything was real. So, um, Mike, Mike, uh, Mike says Dominar Rigel, the, uh, the, the 16th for the win. Um, fantastic. All right. I'll try to do, let's see what else we got here. One more from my discord. Um, so we've talked about this before, but, uh, the last one we're going to do is from Gonza. Who says, how does position and effect help codify the stakes on roles and in the fiction so that all players are on the uh, same page? Great, great question. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll here. It's close. It was tied. Wow. All right. We didn't have that many votes because not as many people know this. Pau Zan and Pilot each got 33% and Rigel and Dargo each got uh, 16%. So uh, one, one, two, two. There's only six people who voted. Um, yeah, I, I, I love Dargo, but I'm going to actually have to give it to, I'm actually going to give it to Pilot. I think Pilot was like the, one of the most interesting characters on the show. Um, anyways. Well, how does position and effect help codify the stakes on roles and in the fiction so that all players are on the same page? Uh, I mean, that is exactly what it does. Um, well, for starters, let's talk about this. Let's talk about position. And the way that I use position. Okay. Now, we all know position is controlled, risky, and desperate this is for forged in the dark here um let me see if i have some sort of uh reference that i can just pull out here here 
we go. And I just wanted to, I just wanted to copy this here so I can put it onto my whiteboard. All right. All right. So here we go. We've got controlled, risky, and de desperate. Now, here's the thing that we have to remember. This is what's you, this is like a very subtle thing with uh, Forge in the Dark here. Okay, but I want to I want to go over this with you. All right, which is these th number one is regardless of whether you are in controlled or risky or desperate. Okay, in all three of these, your odds of success are equal. Note that there is nothing that changes your probability of failure or success with position. Okay. It doesn't actually give you an improvement or a problem with the odds, whether your position is desperate or controlled, your chances of success are the same. That might seem really crazy. That might seem really, really strange. The other thing to note is look at this. When you get a six, you do it. When you get a six, you do it and you get to add a gambit. And when you get a roll of six, you do it. So when you get a six, you get the same outcome in all three of these. So the only way that these three things are different is in what happens in the four to five, one to three positions. This is essentially how bad are the consequences? If you are desperate, okay, and you get a four or five, you can suffer severe harm. But notice that if you get a four or a five in risky, you just suffer harm. And if you get a four or a five in a controlled position, you suffer lesser harm. So getting a controlled position is sort of like a reward. And so what I do with my players is basically when they have a good idea, I want to reward that in the fiction. When they have a bad idea, I want to punish that in the fiction. And I do that by setting the position. So when somebody goes out of their way to describe how they are going to assassinate some, you know, local, you know, some local merchant and they describe for me what they do and what precautions they're taking. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to call upon my, you know, and, and by the way, you know, it doesn't have to be like super bullshit, make, you know, making stuff up. Like you could, you know, if your character was a, If your character was a hound, I don't know if I have my, I don't think I actually have my character sheets here. Um, okay. So if your character was a mystic and you're like, Hey, I've got Vera, my fine sniper rifle. And you know what? Um, I'm going to use that to get set up like really far away so that I have like, like they couldn't even see me unless they were like trying to. And I'd be like, oh, okay, that's a, that's a cool reason. Like, yeah, it sounds like your character would be in a really controlled position because your character has the fictional bonus of being protected. Um, and so for me, what I do is I give players in a status of, 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 of a good idea, I give them a controlled position. And if they have a bad idea, I give them a desperate position. But there's something else that I do. I don't know that the game is officially done this way, but it's the way I do it. I, I keep the party at a certain level of, of, of what I call baseline position. Um, and this is something I do that I don't know that is officially the rule of the game, but I like to think of it this way. When you make your initial engagement role, the only thing that the engagement role makes at the beginning of a score 
is to determine, do they start off in a controlled position, a risky position, or a desperate position? So the way I think of it is, if the players roll, you know, a four, let's say the players roll a six on their engagement roll, they are starting in a controlled position. So the party is sort of at, you know, they're at condition controlled, you know, condition green, right? Red alert, yellow alert, green alert. They're at controlled. And that means that, you know, they are in the driver's seat. And as they continue to take actions, I will continue to leave the default position of what they are doing at controlled. Now, obviously, if this changes in the fiction, I will change it as needed. But basically, if the players have everything under control, they are going to continue to have everything under control. I, as a GM, do not want the players going from, you know, controlled to desperate to risky to ri desperate, back to controlled, controlled, desperate, desperate, because I don't think that that feels like it's appropriate for pacing. You know, I don't feel like that is going to create, um, it, it's going to feel out of sync, right? I like for the, for the tension to sort of build up and I like for the tension to sort of uh, ramp up. So if we look at, um, if we look here at controlled, we can see that one of the outcomes, this, controlled is like the get out of jail free card because uh, when you control something, okay, one of the positions that you can do, uh, one of the positions that you can do with uh, controlled is even if they roll a four or five or a one, two, or three, one of the options, you don't have to do all of these options. You could just do this option. One of the options that you can do is they end up in a risky position or they're blocked or falter. Press on by seizing a risky opportunity or withdraw and try a different approach. So basically this is a way of representing, okay, you didn't fail, but the situation is no longer as controlled. You are now in a risky state. So if a player is in a controlled and they roll one, two, or three, my consequence might just be, hey, you guys are now in condition level risky. And until otherwise noted, all of the positions are going to default to risky. And again, a character could roll a one, two, or a three, or they could roll a four or five. And one of the effects could be you end up in a desperate position. So again, I haven't inflicted actually any consequences on the party. All I've done is ratchet up the tension, okay? Think of these, okay, as soft moves. I'm not really doing anything. I am just building the tension. I am creating an environment that is now going to allow them to be in a desperate position. And as they are now in a desperate position, now we have run out of things to say and do and if we get one, twos, and threes, and fours, and fives, they're pretty tough, right? They're pretty, uh, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're pretty um, nasty consequences. So now that they're in the desperate position, they might need to start coming up with better ideas and, and solutions to try to get them out of this desperate position and back to something that is risky or even back to something that is controlled because that way they are sort of no longer at risk of these horrible, awful consequences. So again, you know, that is kind of where I use position as a result. All right. Um, we're not, we're not, we don't have an opportunity to get into effect here. So um, let me ask the chat this. Um, starting um, example campaign. All right. These are these are the two that I I have uh, the most here, um, and ultimately, you know, GM Scott was the one who was really asking about this, so uh, I'm, I'm I'm inclined to 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 wait for him, so or uh, wait his answer. But let me know what what system that you guys want me to take a look at. Do you guys want me to talk about Scum and Villainy, or do you want me to talk about Blades in the Dark as an example? I'm gonna drink some. Yes, I know your your vote is obvious. All 
All right. All right. Well, uh, it's a pretty it's a pretty clear two to two to one victory. So at uh, 65 percent, 66 percent, it is going to be scum and villainy. So uh, scum and villainy is just blaze in the dark in space, basically. OK, so what I want to show you here is basically what I how I would go about starting a scum and villainy campaign and how I would, uh, you know, go about uh, doing this. All right, so the first things first is the characters are going to, uh, your players are gonna choose a ship and crew. Your characters will influ be influenced by the ship you fly, so discuss the ship selection first. Pick the ship now, but detail the ship during character creation. Now, if we look at the crew, The three options that you have a choice for are picking the star dancer, the Cerebrus, or the fire drake. And remember that in this instance, um, the players are going to, the first thing they're going to talk about is like, what, what do we want to do in this campaign? We haven't made our characters yet, but do we want to be smugglers and blockade runners looking to do odd jobs, small thefts, and find last items, aka totally firefly? Do we want to be Cerebrus and basically be uh, Cowboy Bebop? Or do we want to be Fire Drake and we want to be the Rebel Alliance, okay? Looking to protect the downtrodden and fight the empire, AKA the hegemony, all right? So the first thing that your group is going to do is discuss this and talk about this. It's okay, you know, like and they, there's a lot of things here. They talk about this, it's important to do, you know, and you're picking your genre, but you're doing more, okay? You're doing more than just picking your genre because, your ship will determine how much XP, or I'm sorry, what you get XP for when you play, okay? So for example, um, hegemony, did I say hegemony? Uh, well, I think it's pronounced hegemon in Greek. So I, that's where I think I get confused all the time because the, a person who used to say that all the time was like a college professor. And he was like, always like talking about how in Greek it's hegemony. I think it's hegemon, but I, I could be wrong, but I think in Greek it is hegemon, but I could be wrong. Maybe he was wrong. Um, yes. Ars, mag ars magica. <laughs> um, fight the hodgepodge. So let's take a look at this. If we pick the cool firefly, right? We're, we're uh, what did the game say we were? The game said we were smugglers and blockade runners looking to do odd jobs, small thefts, and find lost items. Cool. But now look what we get experience points for. At the end of every session, for each item below, mark one XP or two XP if it happened multiple times. Another great reason for why you should have multiple scores in a session is you executed a successful transport or smuggling operation. Guess what? If you're a Cerebrus, the bounty hunters, you don't have that. You have, you executed a successful extraction or capture of a bounty. And if you are the Rebel Alliance, you don't have that. You have, you executed a successful job that opposes hegemonic dominance. Um, Google says it's hegemony, but it's still hegemony. Hegemony. Yeah, I think that's the way it's actually supposed to pronounce it. Hegemony. I don't, it's very horrible. Um, so long story short, uh, this not only determines the kind of upgrades that you get, but it also determines what's going to, you know, what's going to give you experience points. Hey, Whipplestein coming in. 20 bucks, super chat. Thank you, Whipplestein. Thank you so much for that. Uh I don't I don't know if it's gotten celebrated through here yet. Um no, not yet. All right. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, so anyways, so the group is going to discuss what they want to do. So we'll just, you know, we'll just be, you know, uh, for, for purposes and sakes of, of easiness here. Uh, thank you, Wibblestein, for that. I don't know if you had a, a message with that, Wibblestein, but let me know. Um, I don't know why you didn't get a, uh, I don't know why you didn't get a little Kefka pop-up. Um, okay. Sorry guys. I got distracted. 
right. So our group, let's just say they're like, oh, we love Firefly, whatever. We want to go, you know, with a star dancer. Okay. So we're going to go with the, uh, you know, generic. <laughs> we're pretty generic in that way. You know, we're just, we're going with the, the star dancer. Okay, great. Sorry, a lot of, spin there it is. There it is. Thank you, Wolpelstein, for that. Thank you so much. No message, but I appreciate the shout out. And you know what? As we go late, as we're going to go late into this, I appreciate the extra money. Thank you so much. Um, so this is how this is kind of who we are. Now, this is where, honestly, as a GM, this is the this is everything that you need to know. Choose a reputation. Why? Well, remember these XP triggers. We are the uh, we're not the fire drake. We are the star dancer. We get XP if we execute a successful transport or smuggler operation. We also get XP if we bolster our crew's reputation or develop a new one. We have to pick a net reputation for our crew. Are we an ambitious crew, a brutal crew, a daring crew? Are we honorable, professional, savvy, strange? Subtle. And I mean, you could probably come up with some outside of that, but I don't really see a need to do more than those seven or eight. This is basically between the ship and the reputation. That is two of the four XP triggers for deciding how the game is going to go. And you know what I always say here on this channel, what gets measured gets managed. What gets rewarded gets repeated. If you create a reputation of being ambitious and ambitious thieves, versus honorable thieves, versus daring thief, perhaps brutal thieves, your group is setting the, they're telling you, this is the kind of game that we want because that's the kind of game that is going to give me experience points. And whether, you know, the players are uh, uh, playing for the story or not, the fact of the matter is it's still a game and experience matters because that's why we have, that's why we are engaging with these mechanics and experience is a way of saying, Good job. You know, it's like, um, you know, there's a line from um, Moneyball where uh, at the end where the Billy Beans manager character gets offered like a tremendous amount of money to manage the Red Sox. I think he turns it down. But the one character says it's not about the money. It's about what the money says. Well, it's not about the experience points. It's about what the experience points says. It says, hey, you did a good job. You did the thing that you're supposed to do that the game wants you to do. And we're going to reward you for that. Um and it's going to set the tone for your whole game. So, um, hegemony is how I learned it in the late 2000s. All right. <laughs> That's the downside of reading. There are words that I know because I've seen them used, but I've never actually heard them say them. <laughs> That's totally true. All right. So, folks, we've got to pick a reputation for our crew. And again, as a GM, while my players are making this conversation and this discussion, I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to say, you know, I mean, I don't, I can read this, but like you earn XP, right? From bolstering the ship's reputation. So think of this as another cue to indicate what sort of action you want in the game. Will you be recklessly ambitious, targeting higher tiers, or will you take on daring G, you know, that other people don't even want to do daring jobs that no one would do that job. That job is crazy. Or are you, you know, do you want to do weird stuff with the strange alien relics? Like, I'll be honest with you. Like, uh, when we played our Scum and Villainy game, we had almost no weird stuff. No, almost very few aliens, no mystical artifacts, no magic, because my group wasn't really interested in that. Hey, Gonza, with their uh, very, very first super chat on a live stream. Thank you, Gonza, for $34. Wow, awesome. Do, <laughs> asking me to stop. <laughs> Wanting me to do a part two instead of extending the stream. Gold set says, I agree a part two. Okay. You know what? I think I think I can get behind this. Um, how about this? How about this? Um, what if, what if we wrap up in the next 15 minutes or so, because I do realize it's getting close to 10. And then we come back Sunday. Is anybody available Sunday? And we can do a part two where it's, you know, uh, 
just more stuff. Oh, okay. Gans is saying uh, uh, to, to continue the campaign, but do a part two. Ron Rittner says, very nice, Gonzo. I think Ron Rittner. <laughs> Don't you have a basketball game to play? Um. So, you know, again, I don't want to like rush through this campaign thing. I think there's a lot of stuff that we could learn from this campaign thing. So I, I do want to be able to do this. So we can like kind of, we'll, we'll keep going till like 10 or, or so, or, or 945, and then we can kind of just wrap up. But then we can come back on Sunday and, you know, maybe we can do like a, maybe we can do like a Sunday, you know, 5 p.m. or a Sunday 6 p.m. stream. I give ourselves a little bit more time and maybe a little bit nicer for some of our people who are uh, across the pond or whatnot. Does that sound reasonable? All right. But before we do, I do want to, I, I do want to wrap this up. I mean, I do want to keep, keep going with what we're going. Uh, but thank you everybody for those super, super chats. And thank you Gonza for, for finishing that up. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Ronald Rittner for your kind, kind words. All right, folks. So we're going to do another poll. Uh, what kind of crew are we making here? Um, so what is our cruise rep? Are we, let's see, brutal. I like that one. Are we daring? I like that one. Are we honorable? Uh, honorable. Or are we, are we strange? I like that one too. All right. So, you know, as a GM, I want to be guiding this conversation. And you know what also too, as a GM, I don't think there's anything wrong with expressing some of your concern, you know, some of your ideas here. But I, I will say this, like whatever the group picks here, now does this mean that every single score that you do for the rest of the game has to be a, you know, a, a transport or smuggling operation? And does everything that you need to do bolster your reputation to create? No, but what it does mean is that your players are going to be highly incentivized to try to do that at least once, if not twice per session, so that they can get the most experience points. And why wouldn't they want experience points? Of course they want crew XP. They want to be able to buy all these cool new things for their ship, right? They want to upgrade the hull and the comm systems, the weapon systems, the engines, right? They want to create, they want to get cool new special abilities and new ship upgrades like dark hyperspace lane maps. I mean, this stuff is fun. You know, there's nothing wrong with that stuff being fun. Um, pick strange because I always struggle when players go for weird in Blades in the Dark. Well, we didn't pick Blades in the Dark, did we? Blades in the Dark is easy to go weird because ghosts are everywhere. The supernatural is everywhere in Blades in the Dark. I think that's actually the easiest. I mean, hell, my, my last Blades in the Dark campaign was a group they were um, not smugglers. Their crew type was uh, the merchants. I don't remember what those are actually called. Um, what are they called? What are they called? They are hawkers. They sell vice. So my crew or my players were drug dealers who basically made drugs out of supernatural material like, like ghost essence and uh, like uh, bitter, bitter resentment and ex, you know, and so they would like kill people who are like in the middle of, uh, I mean, this is a little getting a little bit off for the, like they set up an illegal, oh, gosh. Okay. So if we look at the Hawkers, okay. in their, in their turf map. So they, one of the things that they can do is they can acquire a tur a vice den and a luxury venue. I don't remember exactly which one of these is long story short, this group of drug dealers, uh, set up, uh, acquired a brothel. And what they would do is they created a kind of arcane mechanism to extract the ecstasy of somebody um, enjoying themselves through sexual encounters and collected that and distilled it into a drug that they could then sell on the street. And well, they actually had a high level clientele. So while they started on the street, they very quickly infiltrated the highest levels of society. So their uh, uh, their goal was to basically just sell people various drugs that were fucked up and crazy and weird and strange. And um, you know, but again, they weren't they were hawkers, and that this is what this is what they did, you know. And so they they had some weird stuff, you know, like like a, a you know they 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 joked that you know like it was they joked that it was called like they're like well I'm like well, what are you gonna name the drug, you know? It's like 
I was like, it's like basically a, an orgasm in a pill. And they go, we're going to call it Viagra. That was like, a, that was a joke. But um, anyways. Uh, all right. Well, 58% of you, uh, 58% of you said daring is what our crew is, our, our crew's reputation. Uh, there we go. Crew's reputation. So our crew is going to be daring. So already off the bat, you know, that means that the, I, to me, you know, that's, that's contending with, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the crazy weirdest, like these characters are going to be pushing themselves to the limits, right? So we have a start answer. And we have a daring reputation. And again, this whole time I am listening, right? I'm just listening and making little notes. Okay, now this is where, this is where it all starts to come together. We customize our ship. Each ship starts with several pre-selected ship systems that reflect its focus. For example, our start answer starts with a bigger hull to help carry cargo, both legal and illegal. Choose between two additional ship systems to improve. We can improve the engines or the hull or the comms or the weapons. Two of them, but not four of them. We can also choose instead to improve the quality of our crew, but it'll cost us two cred. And by the way, what does this mean? It basically means you can level everybody in your crew up. That's basically what it means in terms of Blades in the Dark language. Basically, instead of starting at level one, everybody can kind of start at level two. Uh, let me see if we can find it here. Um, yeah, so this is your crew. Basically, you start at level zero. If you could think of it that way, actually. You start at level zero, and your crew can be level one, level two, or level three is the max, right? Um and that is used for position and effect versus the tier ranking of the, you know, of the other uh, things that you're going against. We, we've talked about this before. Oh, sorry. I wasn't showing you any of that. Sorry. Crew ranking here. You can see it, it starts blank, but you could add one box. So you start level zero. You're essentially starting at a tier zero crew, but you could start as a tier one crew. So you're, you're more like a, you know, you're, you're a pretty elite, elite group of people if you're tier one. Um, but if we do that, uh, it'll cost us two cred out of our commun com communal pool, and we will owe the folks that helped you improve it. A higher crew quality require, requires to the quality of your gear and the equipment. You'll be able to take on more powerful factions. Um, again, remember one of the ways to determine position and effect, especially effect, is to look at the tier of your crew, of your PCs, and look at the tier of their opposition. If the tier's opposition the tier of the opposition is higher than the tier of the PCs, you may want to give them limited effect. Or if the tier, you know, if the PCs are tier zero and they're going up against tier three faction, tier four faction, you might say, sorry, you don't have any effect on them. You know, you're, you just, they're, they're, they're too good. <laughs> their, their armor is too thick. You know, their shields are too broad. Their, the, the power ratings, your, your, your particle cannons wouldn't even make a fizzle on their energy deflector shields. You know, they're just too powerful. Um, so you might want to level up. Um, and it says, you know, you'll be able to take on more powerful factions, okay? After you decide what you want to improve, the GM will tell you about a faction that helped you get these improvements. They did you a favor, and how did the crew respond? And the crew can, again, your, your PCs can ju vote to pay them off. They can owe them one, or they can stiff them. And not have to pay them. Well, needless to say, not only is your PCs choosing whether they want to go with engines or hull or comms or weapons, but when they pick a faction that helped them, this is your first goal as a GM. Uh, or sorry, your first uh, real tidbit as a GM. Because what I'm trying to do, ideally, is at, at after session zero... Okay. I want to have two to three factions that the PCs are engaged with. And ideally, I want there to be three 
what we would call fronts active in my game. Now, I typically make one of them related to the PCs, one of them unrelated, and ideally, one of them is PC driven. So we'll talk about this as we kind of go through this. But um, but right now, we got to make we got to do some voting here. Um, all right. So what do we want to do? Um, do we want to improve? And we don't we don't have to vote. We can just throw it out and chat here. Do we want to improve our ship systems, or do we want to level up the ship? All right. Chill beats indeed. Um, so in our case, uh, being from the the the, uh, the hull quality here or the engine quality, engine quality obviously means you can go faster. Uh, comms quality means that you can, uh, you know, basically more electronic countermeasures. You know, I, I like to think of comms as also being kind of somewhat of the, you know, the, the computer systems. Um, and then uh, obviously weapons, we don't, our default, thing doesn't have any weapons. Um, so let's say that our group chooses to go for, let's say our troop, our, our group instead is going to go for, uh, let's say, you know what? We're going to say that they're going to improve the crew quality. Let's go with that. They're like, you know what? We want to be daring. We, we, we could use the tier. So they go, okay, so we're going to, improve our tier, okay? Improve the crew quality. Now, we saw before that this is gonna cost us two cred, all right? And we will owe the folks that helped you improvement, all right? So we're already out two cred, all right? Now, the GM is now going to tell us about a faction that helped us get those improvements. They did you a favor. How did the crew respond? So this is the first time as a GM that we have to pick something. Well, here's the key. We go to the back of the book. All right. And we find the factions of the game. Here they all are in alphabetical order. But more importantly, here they are in tier order by category. So we have forces that are aligned with the hegemony. Uh, hey, Ben. Uh, so Ben, the first uh, hour and a half, uh, I'm sorry, the first two and a half hours roughly were all about answering people's questions about Power by the Apocalypse and Scum and Villainy. And then because we hit our tip goal, we extended the stream. We're actually going to come back Sunday and we're basically doing an example of setting up a Forge in the Dark campaign and how I would do it and what I, was look, what I would be looking to do. So that is what we're doing. And we'll probably wrap here in about, you know, 15, 20 minutes and we'll, we'll keep it going on Sunday. Um, so we can have a hegemony force, a weird force or a criminal force. And as a GM, you already know a little bit about your, your party. They, whether they, uh, are, you know, they're daring star dancers, right? So this is a great opportunity for you to talk about who helped them out. And, 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 and you get to pick which of these uh, kind of forces that you want to go with. Now, my general recommendation is because these are people that were helping the crew out, my recommendation be, is that they would be a tier higher. Okay. So this was a tier zero crew that got raised to tier one. So it makes sense to me that it would be a tier two crew. Now, a tier three or tier four crew could do it as well. But the fact of the matter is, Tier three and tier four crews probably aren't going to deal or worry about anybody that's so minor and unimportant as these people. Now, remember, improving the quality of your crew basically means that, like, your people got special training, your people got special equipment, but you can also just sort of just kind of warp, warp the fiction around it. Now, I'm the GM. This is where I get to sort of extend it. And I can look at this and say, okay, I think I want to go with something from the hegemony, all right? And I can look at some of the tier two or tier three factions and I can pick one that the party got helped out by. So we've got a couple here. News network doesn't make sense. 
Cult of the Seekers does, though. Let's take a look at Cult of the Seekers is. Wandering mystics who study artifacts and seek new places. Members include the Hegemon's mother. They want to open the Hantu gate. Okay, so there's kind of like a weird, you know, force relics type feel here. I don't know that I love that. What about the Yaru? Guild that force grows clones for labors. Clones are short-lived. They have a symbol on their foreheads, and they are supposedly only barely sentient. Folks are distinctively uncomfortable around their clones. Hmm. That could be interesting. Do I want to do I want to deal with with that kind of stuff? I could. Um All right. I'm going to go with Ooh, Isotropo Max Secure. I'm just picking. I'm just I'm I'm getting fun. I'm having fun now here. Um I want the idea of somebody I want like House Malekith. Who's House Malekith? All right, here we go. I love it. Okay, here we go. House Mala, House Mac, Malkath, Malkath, Maclath, Mal, how would you pronounce that? House Malkath, maybe House Malkath, a powerful noble house of the hegemony. The G is soft. Okay, hold on a sec. Google pronounce. Let's see what, oh my God, this is an actual fucking video. I hate you so much. Oh man. Hegemony. That is the American pronunciation? Hegemony. Hegemony. Ah, that is the British pronunciation. So there you go. Hegemony. Hegemony is the American pronunciation. Hegemony. Hegemony is the British pronunciation. So I am simply being British. Hegemony. 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 All right. So anyways, um... But since so many people are apparently offended by it, I will say hegemony, just like Ars Magica. Um, anyways, so I want to go with a hegemonic force. And I like the idea of this house Malachite, a powerful noble house of the hegemony, ostensibly owns the sector represented by the governor who lives on Warren. So I like the idea. Okay. And this is me as a GM. I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking out loud. My characters want to be daring. I want to be. I like the idea that maybe House Malclath hired some disposable assets, right, in the form of the crew. And they were willing to basically raise them up and, and get them well-equipped for a mission to do something for them that maybe was like off the books, right? Or maybe, you know, kind of was specific to their... Uh, unique talents and unique skill sets. But more important than that was sort of a, uh, a you know, a uh, disposable asset. Now I decide that because that's something that I am interested in. So I go to the players and I say, okay, here's the deal. Um, you, uh, you were sponsored by house Malkleth, Malkleth. They are a noble house that basically has their tendrils in everything in this sector, um, throughout the sector, but they aren't the, you know, they aren't the hegemony, right? They are just a noble house. So maybe they were having you do something a little bit covert, a little bit off, you know, under the radar, maybe something that, uh, you know, to avoid any imperial, uh, entanglements. And then I asked the, then I get to ask, or then I get to ask, then I must ask the, um, Sorry. Uh, already lost my spot. Cool. Here we go. Um, then we get to ask the group, okay, what 
After you decide what you want to improve, the GM will tell you about a faction to help you get those improvements. They did you a favor. How did you respond? So basically, now remember, we already paid them two cred. So we could pay them off, we could owe them one, or we could stiff them. And already, we are potentially setting ourselves up here for a faction and a faction clock. Because if they stiff them, great. House Malclaith, they're upset about them. You know, they're going to come after them. You already start with minus one status with them. On the other hand, if you pay them off, all right, you're out of money. But you know what? You don't have any strings attached to them, but they have a good working relationship with you. And they might come back to you again and ask you if you want to keep working with them. And then obviously you could also owe them one, which is basically stiff them, in, but in reverse. Okay. And it says, by the way, if we choose crew quality, we must take this option. So in this case, we are locked in and we are going to owe them one. Promise them you'll return the favor down the line when they ask and gain plus one status with them. If they choose crew quality, they must players must take this option. So that means that we have a plus one status with House Malclaith. And now we know that one of the two to three factions that we're going to be dealing with is House Malclaith. And guess what? We owe them one. So already off the bat, when the game starts, then I could be, I could have a clock. I could have a job, right? A lot of times what I like to do is I like to like, a lot of people like to start their games like in media rest, like in the middle of a job, which is fine. You could totally do that. Um, but another way I like to do it is to basically say like, Hey, you have three pending scores, basically three jobs that you could go do. And one of them might be this house Malclaith job. And they are basically saying, Hey, remember when we helped you out? Well, guess what? What goes around comes around and we need your help. And so, uh, you know, this is kind of like, you know, you're being called in, you're not, you're being activated to be coming in. And of course the, the, the best part of the most fun part will be when there's maybe, maybe this is a really daring, very high paying, right? Job. And the party's like, Oh, we really want to take that job. But we did say that we owed house Malclaith a favor. And then the third option might be something that's more player driven. And this could be something that the players talk about, like, what do we want to accomplish or what do we want to do? Or like, what is one of our own personal goals that we want to accomplish? And this might be a job that helps advance, you know, a PC um, goals. And so from the very beginning of the game, the players have this kind of, uh, you know, ir you know, a certain level of irritation. And by the way, they might go, okay, you know what? We, we want to get experience and money. We're going to take this job. And I say, that's no problem. And then during the middle of this job, which is a score, somebody rolls a one, two, or a three. And, you know, I'm thinking off screen too. I go, you know what? Great point. You're out here doing this job, getting into trouble, kind of making a little bit of ruckus for yourself. You know, who's not help. help you know, who's not happy about that. House, uh, house Malkaith. Okay. They're, they don't like that they helped you out and now you're out here making all this ruckus. I'm going to start a six clock and I'm going to tick it twice. And this is while you're doing this job, while you're doing this score. And already the party's like, oh man, like, do we just go do the job for House Malclaith? Or do we need to like, should we, should we try to smooth things over with them? And like, you know, and then of course, by the time they get back, from their first score, you know, you now have another score open for them. And maybe there's another clock that is started. And eventually there's a, the, the plate starts spinning in the air and the, and the group has to decide, do we want to go deal with this? Do we want to go deal with this? Okay. So, um, we owe house Malclaith a favor. So we get status with them and we presumably owe them one. We need to do a job. All right. Then uh, we're going to finish. We're just going to do the finish the ships. I promise we're not going to do anything more than that. Choose a special ability. Again, I told you this, this game takes care of itself. Choose one of the special abilities listed on your ship. If you can't decide which one to pick with, go with the first one on the list. It's placed there as a default choice. It's good. To, it's important to pick a special ability that everyone's excited about. You can earn more special abilities by earning experience points with your crew. Um, 
Just like picking your ship type and origin and systems, choosing a special ability is another chance to focus the game. Instead of playing a generic ship crewed, screwed, crewed by scoundrels, you end up with the star dancer and her crew of ambitious smugglers, or in our case, uh, daring, who end up who end up with the star dancer and her crew of ambitious smugglers who salvaged the ship after her previous crew went missing. They stiffed the Dyrenic gang when they upgraded the hull and weapons of the ship and are known for their getaway ability, showcasing a knack for running from their problems. So going back to our ship, we get to pick one of these special abilities for our star dancer. And the first one is considered to be a good idea. But you gain potency, which remember has to do with um, effect. When you have potency, you tend to have better effect. If you would have limited effect, you might have standard effect. If you would have standard effect, if you have potency, you might have great effect. You gain potency when you scramble or helm to avoid capture or run a blockade. And if you're doing a delivery job, you get an extra die when you make your engagement roll. So that's pretty fun. But we also have cargo eye, field repair, leverage, just passing through, home cooking. Um, I never recommend that you allow anybody um, to start with the last one on your ship, which is just everybody gets to add one, but you can do it sometimes. It's just a little boring at character creation. These are much better at sort of focusing the game. So we, as a group here, we get to pick, and again, the group is now gonna be excited. And here's the coolest part. They haven't even started character creation yet. They have no idea who their character is going to be, but all the players are all focused on this one ship sheet. Or a lot of times I'll give everybody a copy of the ship sheet. And they're kind of, they're working as a whole to build this one character, the crew, the ship. And that ties them together before we ever get to character creation. But as we've done before, uh, let's put it to the poll. So I'm gonna have you guys vote for which special ability our star dancer starts with. And then we'll do one more section after this and then we'll be done for the night. All right, so the option obviously is the first one, which is the getaway. But I also like this idea of cargo I. We get extra money, that's cred, whenever we do smuggling and delivery jobs. And whenever we gather information, we can always ask what is the most valuable here? So that gives us a little bit of, of a mercenary at bend. But we are also daring. So maybe we take field repairs in case we need, you know, if we plan on getting a lot of fire flights or a lot of perhaps a lot of damaged landing gear is in our future. And then lastly, we'll take just passing through, which lets us get less heat. In other words, we're really good at, uh, at kind of just uh, disappearing off the people's radar once we're, uh, you know, done with the job. All right. So I'm going to let you all vote. And we'll pick our special ability. And again, this is a conversation that you're having with your group and talking about it. Because if some, if your group takes a special ability, they're kind of saying, hey, we kind of want to do that. If your group takes cargo eye, they're going to want to go do smuggling and delivery jobs because they get extra money. And they're going to be like, yeah, this is cool. Um, ben, ooh, an infinity of ships would work so well with this game. Yes, the game only gives you the three default ships. And I think having more would be awesome. <laughs> My players wanted recon drones. Okay. I said it was HNN that provided them. The players said they would owe them one. I said, sure. The HNN had access to your drone footage. I can't wait for this. That's pretty awesome. That's a great faction clock. Oh, sorry about that. I was thirsty. Um, how many people are we down to? Oh, we're still at 50. We were at, we were at like 80 earlier, but you guys are sticking through. Again, we'll be wrapping up here in a couple minutes. All right. Well, Cargo I has it at uh, 58% of the votes. So our our ship or our crew or whatever, we're going to pick up the, the Cargo I ability. And uh, so we have this now as our ability. So that means that we're going to want, right? We're going to want to be smuggling and trying to get money and coin and looking for, you know, now, you know, we're, we're daring, but we're smugglers and we're always looking for things that are vulnerable. And so now I'm starting to get a vibe of like, kind of like getting a vibe of like treasure hunters, right? Like kind of Indiana Jones, right? What is it? What is, what does Marion call it? Your damn fortune and glory, right? I'm kind of getting... 
a kind of space Indiana Jones vibe. Maybe that's just me, but like the idea of this, again, this group of, of daring, uh, uh, daring smugglers and, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, with an, with an eye for, for value, right. With an eye for treasure. So there's kind of a, mer not mercenary, but there's kind of like a, I think a treasure bent. I could be wrong, but you know, this is the things that, again, that is a group and a GM you should, you should be talking about and getting excited about and getting your group excited about. All right. Um, then <laughs> we named the space dog, Indiana junior junior. All right. Um, just uh, Beowulf. Well, we, we're going to be wrapping up here, Beowulf, in like 10, 15 minutes. So don't worry about it. I know I said that 10 or 15 minutes ago. Beowulf, thank you for joining in, and thanks for hanging out with us, Beowulf. So the last thing that we do, in addition to the upgrades each ship comes with, you as a group get to add two additional upgrades to our ship. For example, you might pick the Cerebrus's stun weapon upgrade and also the auxiliary armory module. That's a crew that loves their weapons. An upgrade is a valuable asset or a system module that helps the crew in some way, such as an afterburner module or a shuttle. Each ship select starts with pre-selected upgrades that are well-suited for the crew, such as the galley for the star dancer or the brig for the Cerebrus. After you assign your two upgrades, the GM will tell you about, guess what? Two factions impacted by your choices. Remember how I said we wanted three factions for character creation? Guess what? The game is going to give that to us. So we get to pick two upgrades for our ship. So our options are, so again, and, and just to be clear here, so you get assets or system modules. So we could have false ship papers, dark hyperspace lane maps, smugglers rigging, rigging or we could have ship gear, or we could have auxiliary systems or crew gear, uh, not training. That is the one thing that's important. Um, so we have to pick, you know, and we're talking about our characters is, and we're kind of like, oh, like would our character, what would our character, what would our ship want? What cool things do we want from our ship? And like thinking about like the fun stuff that we might do with them. Like, do we want, um, you know, <laughs> thrill seekers? Um, I, Thrill Seekers, I think, is the one that uh, lets you take something else. I can't remember exactly. The, the The final ability in almost every one, like Veteran or Thrill Seekers, is always a little uh, weird. Uh, I just can't remember exactly what they are. Here, let me look this up. Um, yeah, okay, that's it. Each PC gets plus one stress box. <laughs> it costs three upgrades to unlock, not just one. Yeah, so it, it takes three upgrades just to get one. So not not great. But and again, so we, we can't start with that one. So like, for example, uh, we could start with... Uh, dark hyperspace lane maps. These are routes through systems that aren't officially maintained. Sometimes they are faster. They are always less performed, patrolled, but they are filled with way creatures, pirates, and other scoundrels. I mean, that sounds pretty cool to me. Uh, we could also, again, have... Uh, let's go back to our ship here. Now, our ship starts with smuggling compartments and a, ca a cargo hold, but, you know, we could also add something like an armory or a brig, we could add an AI module if we want to have like a cool AI to our ship, like Andromeda from that really bad show, Andromeda. We could add our own little mini shuttle. We could add extra power reserves. Cut into the auxiliary. What auxiliary? We have auxiliary. We could have a drone. We could have a workshop on our ship. So this is just a way for the characters to really kind of explore explore the space. Um, ooh. Uh, was that the Kevin Sorbo one? It was the Kevin Sorbo one. <laughs> Interesting little sci-fi tip. The actress who played Andromeda, uh, Lexa, Lexa Doig, I think is her name. Lexa Doig, Lexa Doig. Um, very pretty lady. Um, she, um, 
she married um Alexa Doig, she married, I believe, the uh, 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 person who played uh, Dan- Daniel Jackson. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. She she married she married um, uh, what's his name? She married Michael Michael Shanks. That's pretty crazy, huh? Um. Anyways, random. Uh, I know. Sorry, getting off topic here. Um. But yes, it is the one with. Uh, it is the one with Kevin Sorbo. Uh, okay, back to what we were talking about before. So we've got dark hypes for space lanes. We've got false ship papers. We've got uh, Lucky Charm. This one's kind of cool, right? We're very daring. It could be an Ur. That's like the ancient race, right? The you know every every sci-fi show has like the ancients. Whether it is an Ur artifact or a few mementos prominently displayed on the bridge, sometimes luck just is something you have. Each crew, the crew starts with plus one gambit. And it costs, oh, but it does cost two upgrades. So that would be both, that would be, have to be both of our upgrades. All right, so let's let's pick some stuff here. Um, throw it out in chat. I saw somebody say, um, let's see. Somebody said that the, let's go, I'm going to put the poll up. All right. And then lastly, we have our upgrades. So I'm going to go with um, an AI module, a hollow emitters. I think that's pretty cool. I'm going to go with a dark hyperspace lane maps. And I'm also going to go with, uh, I'm going to go with stasis pods. I don't know why, but that's what we're going with. All right, so everybody vote for your favorite, and then the top two we'll we'll we'll, we'll add to the ship. Um, and again, the thing about it is, as we pick these, going back to the P, uh, the PDF as we vote, we are going to choose two. Um, we are going to choose two factions. The GM will tell you two factions impacted by your choices. One faction helped you get an upgrade. You're on good terms. Did they broker the deal? Did you run the job for them? We can ask the players. Did we? Did they bail? Did you bail them out of trouble? They like you. You get plus one status with them, and you can spend one cred and get plus two status with them. That's like a super ally. The other one is we screwed somebody over, and we start with minus two status with them. All right. So basically, one of these we got on good terms, and one of these we screwed somebody over. Right. Uh, so that 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 is where this game, I think, just gets super, super fun. All right. Uh, again, we're in the interest of time. We're going to wrap this up. All right. We've got dark hyperspace lane maps is at first place easily. Zero percent for stasis pods, by the way. So uh, we're going to go with. Uh, we're going to go with dark hyperspace lane maps. So I'm just going to put dark lane maps. And then our other one that won was an AI module. Okay. Now, we have to pick. Now, again, the GM gets to pick two factions that are related to these things. Now, this is this is my suggestion to you. You can, you can take it. You can ignore it as much as you want. We already chose something from the hegemony, right? That was House Malkaith, right? That was uh, right here, House Malkaith. Let's pick two uh, things that are different, maybe something weird, maybe something criminal, right? So for, and I, I could honestly see where the dark hyperspace lane maps could come from people that were criminals, but I could also see where it could come from people uh, that were weird, Right. So I think we're going to go with the weird and we're going to say that the, uh, I'm just, I'm just, I don't really know super every detail about them. I know the blades and dark care people a lot more. Um, so we're going to say that the, the mendicants, we don't know who they are, but they're somebody. Okay. They were people we screwed over. So they're a weird 
tier two weirdness cult. Okay. And we can see here that they says that they were, uh, you know, they were, they now wander the stars as traveling physicians and healers. Well, apparently they had some sort of lost secret tech and we stole it. <laughs> so as a GM, we basically get to say, okay, you have minus two status with the mendicants. And do you want to pay a cred to try to make it a little bit better? And they might say no. And so, by the way, right away, you might even start the campaign off with, you know, uh, mendicant, you know, b bounty hunters who are coming for their maps, you know? And right off the bat, like, you're like, okay, there's an eight clock. There's no ticks on it yet, but they are on the trail. They want, they want your, you know, they, they they want their, they want their, their prize back. And of course you could also take that, you know, down a really weird extreme lane. But then we also, uh, Goldicott says we should, we should look at the night, night speakers. Ooh, that, that night speakers is a really, really fun one too. Night speakers are mystics with dark proclivities bent on finding a dangerous set of precursor artifacts. So it could be that one, right? So there's a lot of really cool options that you could have for it. Now for the AI module, again, I want to go back and I want to look at something now from the criminal organization. So we stole an AI module from maybe from the Cobalt Syndicate or the Janus Syndicate. Let's see. Well, Janus Syndicate are weapons dealers that specialize in ship weapons headed up by the ruthless Victor Bax who insists on doing the first deal with every client in person. Now, remember, they they, they equipped us with this. They're, they are our allies. So maybe that's not our, our deal. What about the Cobalt Syndicate? Organized labor union dabbling in a little crime to fund their demands for a better life. Uh, you know what? I don't feel like they would have an AI module, so I'm going to skip on them. Maybe maybe we will go with this uh, Janus Syndicate. Um, we'll say that the Janus Syndicate is who we got our AI module from. And we'll add it to our sheet here. And again, um, we get, okay, well, it's not really working right now. Uh, so this is the Janus Syndicate. And we get plus one with them unless we want to spend a cred, and then we get plus two. And the group pretty much says, no, we're, we're good on that. You know, we're fine with that. It's like, okay, great. So when we finally finish this, we now have our ship, and we have three factions that we have sort of interacted with and we have a history with. We have House Malclaith that we owe a favor to and we are currently at status of plus one with. We have the Mendicants who are a traveling group of healers and mystics who we are at minus two with because we stole their dark space hyperlane maps. And then we have the Janus Syndicate, who, and for reasons that we didn't have time to get into, have helped us out and have given us a top-of-the-line AI module for our ship. So we have three factions that we are engaged with. And guess what? Each of these factions will have their own goals, which will probably be represented by a clock and things that they want to have accomplished. And that might be information that you keep to yourself initially. But the fact of the matter is they are going to try to influence and impact the party. The mendicants are going to maybe send bounty hunters after them. The Janus syndicate might, you know, maybe who knows, maybe they, they try to hack they, the AI system, you know, becomes, you know, malevolent and tries to take over their ship system. And the Janus syndicate was playing them the whole time. Right. I mean, like there's a, there's a ton of different options and ways that you could go with this. But the point is this is going to lead to a bunch of starting missions. And as the players make their characters, they'll probably have things that they want to accomplish, things that they want to do. And as a result, when the game starts, you might have three or four or five 
hooks that the party could use free play for. And before you know it, you're into your first score and clocks are getting created. Clocks are getting ticked and the players are accumulating cred and the players are accumulating experience points and downtime. And the game is off and off to the races. And now who knows what's going to happen to it. So, um, this was part one of our, of our campaign creation and, uh, scum and villainy uh, uh, session. We did really well on the tips tonight. Thank you, everybody. So we're going to be back. We're going to come back Sunday. We'll do a system. We'll do a secret system Sunday stream and we'll talk more about Powered by the Apocalypse, Scum and Villainy. If you have questions or comments, I'm going to keep the Discord thread going. Maybe there was a, a couple questions I did miss because I got, not, I didn't get every question from every person. Uh, I try to get at least one question from each person. And uh, maybe some new ones will come up after this uh, episode. So Always want to kind of, you know, be get going through this. And a lot of people say, I want examples. I want examples. I want examples. So, uh, you know, maybe we'll do more examples. But if you're a member of the Discord, Patreon, let me know. And uh, and we can kind of go from there. All right, everybody. Um, let me see here. Ben says we had to go with maps. Everybody agreed that maps were awesome. Um, my, when we played Scum and Villainy, they didn't start with like dark space hyperlay maps, but they acquired them later. So at some point. Um, so thank you everybody, by the way, for coming out and supporting me tonight. Uh, awesome chat. Thank you. Gonza, Wolpelstein, Sean for the awesome super chats to keep us going for, for almost uh, three and a half hours. Uh, thank you to, uh, Jason B, John H, GM Scott and Scott P. So all the Scots came out today for keeping us tipped up so that we, uh, had, uh, the, uh, example campaign that we kind of went through and started. And I think this is a great educational experience. A lot of people don't know how do you start these games? And I think just seeing it an example is, is probably pretty useful. Um, and, uh, yeah. And thank you Lope for your super chat as well. Um, don't forget, don't forget about the real John H that's right. John H and Jason B they were both in there. So thank you. Um, and, uh, thank you everybody to who subscribed. Thank you to everybody who's a patron. Your support is awesome. We're starting off 2024 really strong and I'm really happy about that. All right, everybody. That's going to do it for me. I will see you next time. Sunday, special secret Sunday stream. Uh, we might go a little early. I'll ask the patrons to see how they feel. I mean, ultimately, they 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 kind of guide the direction. But maybe we can start a little bit earlier, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, uh, just to kind of get things uh, rolling early. All right, everybody. I'll see you then next time. Night's the last call. You know it is. Peace out. Bye, everybody. <laughs>